But to all of you, remember you're from a very special era. An era where you, you needed guts, courage, skill, good sense to get on and do it. And what you did was very special. And it's very special, I think, that we all get together here and enjoy it and get together again. And frankly, I'm going to say if we did it every three months, that'd be great, but it might be too testing, whatever. But try and keep coming. Try and bring along other people, because this is special. And uh, sorry to interrupt all your talking. I'll get back to you shortly as we talk to some, some of the people here. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And we've also fitted a second camera, because very rarely do you get the opportunity to see Peter Brock or Alan Moffat actually drive a race car. Once again, they may or may not have been scuffed up. Should be looking at us. Job to uh, piece the car back together after a nasty accident uh, in practice earlier. Has some exciting news because he's been able to coax uh, Alan Grice to return from Europe. Six James Hardy classic. Super Welcome back to Surfers Paradise. Well, with the countdown now on for the James Hardy 1000, we're into the endurance races, and that introduces an all-new science into each event. Pit stops are of crucial importance. They have to be well-organised and efficient. There's no point saving time on the track if you blow it in pit lane. Bringing a car into the pits is a tricky business requiring a lot of specialised equipment and highly trained personnel. Typical of most stops, we see two or three churns of fuel emptied, four wheels fitted, the engine checked and a driver change affected. It's an art form in itself, each group member specialised in an area and coordinating all at once. Sometimes, though, the plans don't always work out. Recently at the Spa 24-hour Enduro, Neil Lowe and the Mobile Holden dealer team Commodore found out that his car's high-tech internal jacking system had its drawbacks. Then there was the John Harvey routine pit stop for a driver change. Routine in all aspects except for the lack of a driver. Brock eventually showed up. Changing drivers should be relatively easy, but as you've just seen, it doesn't always work out that way. A big component of successful endurance racing is a big stock of fuel, tyres, oil and wheels. Teams must be ready for all conditions, wet or dry. Professional race teams work hard at making their stops as near to perfect as possible. A driver has to work so hard to say gain uh, five or six seconds. You might work uh, for 10 or 12 or 15 laps say at Bathurst to gain four or five seconds or six seconds, something like that. Now, you can lose that uh, so easily in, in a bad pit stop. The hardest thing in a pit stop is really getting the drivers to change over. And that's the biggest uh, toe far they always seem to make, is they, they bugger it up, in other words, sort of thing. But, like, we've been practising hard this year on that with the two drivers and getting them to do the right job for us. So I think, really, yes, we do a lot of work on it. It, it is important. What's the good of a, a driver working his little butt off out there to sort of gain some time on the circuit, and then we come in here and lose it all for him. You work very hard in all facets of it, and the pit stop's no exception, from your fuelers to your tyre changes, to the standard of air application to the jacks, everything just has to work. It, uh, it has to be a total coordination, so yeah, it's, it's work, and it's quite hard work. So when the race is on, this is what should happen. Remember, it gets very busy in here. Tempers are often frayed. It's anything but a controlled environment. Four wheels and tyres go on the car, up to 120 litres of fuel dumped in the back, and one of the most difficult tasks of all, affecting the driver change. It all has to be done in something like around about 20 seconds. So there you have it, the Japanese and Australian combination today, BP300. At present, it's not so squeezy in here, but Mike Raymond, shortly, there'll be plenty of action. You're not wrong there, Neil, because the cars are being fitted up at the moment for the BP Plus 300, which is round two of the Australian Manufacturers or Endurance Championship from Surface Paradise International Raceway. And as we've mentioned to you earlier today, George Fury has landed pole position for the Peter Jackson Nissan Skyline team with a 115.2 second lap yesterday. His time was equaled in the later session by Kiwi Graham Crosby and the Bob Jane T-Mart's Commodore. 
is the furious farmer George what a season he's had uh, this year runner-up to Robbie Francovic in the Australian Touring Car Championship Queensland's favorite son Dickie Johnson in the Motocraft uh, Mustang V8 and of course joining uh, Dick this afternoon in the co-driver's role Greg Hansford our friendly Kiwi Graham Crosby out of it you ham <laughs> and of course uh, with sponsorship from Bob Jane T-Mart benefactor Bob has uh, made sure that Graham is able to do the endurance championship and our old pal Al Mr Moffat in the number zero five car so obviously he is going to start the race today and Alan Moffat and Peter Brock of course uh, have done the endurance races in Europe the European Touring Car Championship Jimmy Richards looking for a win gee what a professional Jim Richards and the JPS BMW team I tell you Ron Meacham has for BMW Australia hasn't had too much to uh, smile about with all the uh, all the problems of uh, luxury cars the last uh, couple of weeks and information but uh, hopefully for uh, Ron and for BMW Jim can get up in the endurance championship this afternoon let's have a look how they'll line up on the starting grid for today's BP plus 300 from surface paradise international raceway George Fury pole position starts off the inside a 115.2 time equal by Graham Crosby a 115.2 center of the front row and Peter Jackson, this and Skyline co-pilot Gary Scott on the outside with a 115.4. Row two, we'll see Peter Brock, Alan Moffat starting in the car, a 115.9 yesterday, sharing the second row. Jim Richards and the JPS BMW, a 116.1. Row three, Dickie Johnson of Queensland and Greg Hansford in the Mustang, a 116.4. In the centre, boy to watch today if it rains, Tony Longhurst in the BMW, 116.4, outstanding time. And outside that row, Queensland's Charlie O'Brien in the unsponsored BMW with a 116.4. And row four, of course, Brad Jones and our Japanese visitor in the Starion, 116.7. Graham Bailey in the Commodore with a 116.8. A very, very competitive field. And keep in mind that we have 28 starters in the, um, in the lineup this afternoon. 85 laps around here. And if you just want a little spice for an ingredient, it has just started to trickle rain around Surface Paradise. And all these guys are set up on slick tyres. I don't think we're going to get, you know, wild thunderstorms or anything, but it, uh, we might s just settle in for some uh, steady rain for the first couple of laps. And considering the amount of oil that's been dropped around the circuit today, you have uh, all the ingredients of uh, some hairy racing there for the first couple of circuits. I'll just stick my neck out for a moment. I think uh, normally down in this area the rain comes from the southwest. Looking over that way at the moment, it's, it seems to be clearing up. So you might be right, Mike. We might get a couple of laps of rain, but I think the bulk of the race should be dry this afternoon. Well, local knowledge. Pat were, Pat should know he does the weather occasionally too on PTQ. <laughs> well, there is exactly what Pat was talking about. It's, it's quite fair out there, just over the top of the circuit, some black clouds. And during the course of today's telecast, we have two race cam units fitted in two cars. Dickie Johnson, of course, laconic Queenslander, will be talking us around the circuit. There's Tricky Dickie in the Shell Motorcraft Mustang V8. And we've also fitted a second camera because very rarely do you get the opportunity to see Peter Brock or Alan Moffat actually drive a race car. It's a fixed camera unit, thanks to Dave Thomas and our hard-working race cam unit. Uh, that is the picture you'll be able to see. We'll be able to split the screen and show you the car going around and just how Alan Moffat and Peter Brock do handle the car and how physical, in fact, the V8 Commodore is. And I think you'll find it very, very interesting during the course of the day if you look at Peter and Alan outside the car and see how relaxed they look, and when we take you inside the cockpit, it's a whole different ball game. Yes, that was something that surprised us yesterday when we were watching the two sessions of official practice for today's BP 300 Round 2 of the Australian Endurance Championship. Brock and Moffat both had to work very hard very early on in the car. In fact, as early as around about three or four laps into driving the car from a fresh stop, the thing started to slide and the full 1,300 kilograms slewing around this course, which is uh, a very quick track and a very abrasive track, is going to make uh, life fairly difficult for both of these two drivers, certainly uh, Alan Moffat and Graham Crosby, and therefore one must consider the slightly lighter 635 BMWs and perhaps the Nissan uh, Skyline, the turbos. And uh, I think we might even see some of the Class B cars come up as well, like the Mitsubishi Starion, or perhaps even Colin Bond, who teams today with Lucio Cesario in the Alfa Romeo GDB6. And with the possible threat of an odd shower, 
that will only uh, make life a little easier, I think, for the lighter weight cars. But still, Graham Crosby doing a tremendous job yesterday. There's John Smith, incidentally, in car 16. He shouldn't be coasting along like that on the warm-up lap. In fact, he now pulls off to the grass. He was the driver who finished, I think, fifth outright in round one of this title at Sydney's Amaru Park just a few weekends ago. Smithy now jumping out of the car, and he will not be a pleased boy at all. That's bad luck for uh, Johnny Smith, who's one of the real driving talents in Australia. The man has been able to uh, bump wheels with uh, Keki Rosberg and all of the, uh, the Formula One pilots. Jacques Lafitte came over here to run Mondial. A very talented man. I tell you, if he was in an outright class car uh, for the lead, you'd see Johnny Smith up there doing everything that Peter Brock and uh, Alan Moffat and, uh, of course, George Fury have been doing. There is some talk of that next year as well for Toyota, which should be interesting. There's John Harvey, operations manager for the Mobile Holden dealer team. We've given you the top ten. Perhaps we might also uh, like to list for you the other starters in the event. Here's behind the top ten drivers, rounded out by Graham Bailey. We've got Peter McLeod in the Auto Park Commodore. A very good time from him yesterday on race tyres and in race configuration. Fred Geisler in the Holden Commodore, formerly owned by Steve Masterton, and makes a welcome return to racing after a two-year absence. Colin Bond, position 13, Alfa Romeo GDB6, sharing today with Lucio Cesario, who's back from overseas and having run in the WEC. Alf Grant in the Holden Commodore will start out of position 14. And then one of our Kiwi visitors, Bruce Anderson in the Ford Mustang. Gerald Kay in the Holden Commodore. Tony Mulverhill in the Holden Commodore. And he shares with veteran Sydney driver Ken Matthews. Talking of veterans, Murray Carter will start out of position 18 in the Nissan Skyline. Trevor Ashbury and Steve Reed, car number 19, will start from position 19. Car number 20, John Smith. Then we've got uh, Lester Smurd in the Holden Commodore. Now, one of the things that did happen this morning was that uh, Wayne Anderson was due to drive the second Hind Pack Mustang, but it has, in fact, uh, been replaced by John English, I understand, uh, this morning. So car number 52 now has another driver, Anderson yesterday having food poisoning problems. John Giddings will start in the uh, little Nissan, John Donnelly in the Rover, David Radcliffe in the Toyota Sprinter, David Morton also in the Toyota, and then uh, Whitaker, Clinton, and uh, that rounds out the entire 28 starters in this BP300. Well, quite a strategy change, I would think, with uh, Alan Moffat going to start for the... Uh, Mobile uh, Holden dealer team in car number 05. Well, they, they did intend doing that when I spoke with them this morning. They felt that, as we look at Gary Scott, Alan may have been just a little easier on the tyres was the rationale in the opening laps. As Peter was working pretty hard in the car yesterday and getting it uh, sideways, they felt that they'd be in better shape by around about lap 40 or 45 to bring the car in. And uh, uh, then Peter Brock would get in the car and finish the race. Well, we're just about set for the BP Plus 300 from Surfers Paradise International Raceway, a round two of the Australian Manufacturers Touring Car Championship for 1986. Round three, of course, will be at Sandown. Round four, the James Hardy 1000 at Bathurst. And, of course, it's, uh, it's back across to Oran Park. So we're about 30 seconds away from the start, and the start will be most interesting. The two Nissan Skylines... Early starter on the screen at the moment? Yes. <laughs> the two Nissan Skylines, George Fury, the friendly farmer in car number 30, Cross in the centre of them and the Bob Jane T-Mart's Commodore and Gary Scott on the outside. Flag just about set to go up. Study of concentration. Flag up. Racing in the BP300. Scott has stalled it right on the starting line. He's blown it. O'Brien goes by. And as they head up to the top corner, it could well be George Fury on the inside who takes over the lead with Graham Crosby dropping into second. Dickie Johnson will take third. Peter Brock will be well, Peter Brock's car without a Moffat in fourth. Charlie O'Brien also had a great start there as they head down to IPEC corner for the first time. And bad luck indeed for the Nissan team with Gary Scott, his car, stopping on the uh, starting line. There's the order. George Fury for the Peter Jackson Nissan team heading down to the left-hander. Cross in hot pursuit. Dickie Johnson followed by Alan Moffat. There's Jim Richards out on the grass. And he's being passed by uh, Tony Longer. So Jim has been uh, plowed off the circuit or has run off the circuit. And Colin Bond, an electric start from, from uh, Colin in the Ignis Fridges Alpha Romeo GTV6. Now to Kelly Springfield corner for the first time. And it'll be Fury. Graham Crosby in the Bob Jane T-Marts Commodore and Dickie Johnson. Graham Bailey, a very good start in the Chickadee Commodore and in behind him we've got the auto part entry and there's Gary Scott getting out of car number 15. 
So obviously not just having stalled the car, but some sort of problem which won't allow it to restart. Very disappointing indeed for Gary Scott. Talking to him yesterday after practice, he was confident that he could even uh, chop further off those lap times of the 115.4 as Dickie Johnson closes in on Graham Crosby in the second and third spots. Yes, there's a big thrill for the Queensland crowd at the moment to have Dick Johnson up there in the Ford Mustang. He's found some extra horsepower in the car, he told me this morning. They've been working hard on that car. They didn't contest the first round of the Australian Endurance Championship at Amarillo Park to spend time on development. And he's looking very nice in behind Crosby at the moment. So the order is George Fury from Graham Crosby. Dick Johnson up into third place. A great start from him. And remember that he's got a very talented co-driver to get in as well as we take seventh race cam. Greg Hansman will get in this car around about lap 45. Dick Johnson at the moment, a man full of what he described as a pretty crook wog. He said, I feel awful. So he wasn't even sure whether he'd spend the entire 42 or 43 laps in the car. All the major teams planning to pit around about the halfway mark. Johnson, of course, using tyres especially made for the Mustang now. The uh, Dunlop radials found they're a little bit small uh, uh, for other races and they've got a specially made set of Dunlop radials for the car today. So that could be one of the reasons, so as Neil mentioned, they've also got extra horsepower and he's using that extra horsepower at the moment to close on Graham Crosby. Gary Scott, the news comes through, broke a drive shaft on the line. That's the reason his car is out of commission. Meanwhile, Tricky Dicky closes it up on Cros as they come up to the Dunlop Bridge yet again. And uh, Peter Perfect having a, an eye on uh, Alan Moffat, who's running back there in uh, fourth spot at the moment. And I think he'd be fairly happy with that too. It's a good position to be in. There's no danger in or around him. And he can let the frolic continue up front as we watch Dick Johnson in third position right behind Graham Crosby. Both of these cars using the Dunlop DO3 radials, which is the hardest compound available for these cars, and obviously trying to have a tyre compound which will take them through as much of the race as possible because Surfers is renowned as being one of the most abrasive tracks in Australia. Dick Johnson, car 17. James Hardy, winner. A former Australian touring car champion. They're saying they've settled it down to quite a steady pace. It's a long way, 85 laps around Surface Paradise. There's Johnson running third. That's a great start from Johnson. Then we go back to the scrap that continues with uh, Alan Moffat in number five. Right behind him is Peter McLeod in yet another Commodore. And uh, sitting right in behind McLeod is Graham Bailey in yet another Commodore. So the Commodore's at this stage running uh, fourth, fifth and sixth, doing it comfortably, and Peter Brock keeping an eye on uh, Moffat as they go across the line. McLeod wants to go on a bit stronger, but this is an endurance race, it's not a sprint. Just behind that bunch, we had a glimpse of car number seven, Charlie O'Brien in the 635 BM, and then the real performer of the bunch is young Tony Longhurst in the little 325, but this is Moffat on the right-hand side of screen. Peter McLeod only contesting one lap of round one of the championship at Oran Park when he blew a head gasket which appears to be the Achilles heel of the Commodores at the moment. Mike Raymond having returned from Spa two weeks ago, you saw a lot of that. Here's race cam as Peter McLeod ranges up onto the outside of Alan Moffat's mobile Commodore. Great shots from race cam as we watch one of Australia's, indeed the world's finest touring car drivers at the wheel. Well, McLeod uh, getting a little closer to Alan Moffat. McLeod starting in 11th spot on the grid, so he's been one of the big movers so far today, along with Dick Johnson. And watch Moffat at the wheel of this car. If you think it's easy on the outside, just stop and consider how hard they'll work for something like an hour and 10 minutes in the car before they hand over to their co-driver. Your shoulders, back, arms, obviously the palms of your hand, very, very tired at the end of this stint. The Commodore will be starting to slide and it will continue to become worse and worse as the race wears on. So, here we have Moffat in front of McLeod, just ahead of Graham Bailey, Charlie O'Brien and Tony Longhurst making the gang of five. And then Brad Jones and Rick Geisler behind them. A good start. Let's recap the placings for you. George Fury is our race leader. Second spot, Graham Crosby. And third is Dickie Johnson. And back at Surface Paradise International Raceway, Alan Moffat has just come straight back into the pit area. They have a tyre problem by the look of it, or they've gone perhaps for an incorrect uh, choice of tyres at the start of the race. It's hard to imagine why. Well, they told me this morning that they were going to run their 16-inch diameter Pirelli D3s, and 
can't pick up from that shot what they've put back on the car. It doesn't appear to be the 17-inch Bridgestone, so Colin Young, Young is standing by in the pits. We might get him to go and check that a little later on. Moffat keen to get out as they drop it off the jacks. He would have spent a good 30 seconds there, plus the entry and exit times. It looks like they've still got 16-inch rims on the car. I've got no idea what that was all about, unless one of the tyres was deflating. And he's dropped almost a lap because in the background then as Moffat came underneath the bridge, the race leader George Fury entered the main straight behind him, Graham Crosby. Dick Johnson, Peter McLeod and Charlie O'Brien putting in a fine performance in the BMW. So there's Moffat on lap six pulling into the pits and losing some 45 seconds. Well, it's early days I know in the 85k race. Uh, but that's something that uh, the mobile dealer team certainly didn't require. That was a tyre problem a couple of laps into the race, particularly when their driver was running uh, in about fourth place. However, that's opened it up for Peter McLeod to gain one, Graham Bailey and also Charlie O'Brien. So Moffat now trying to regain some valuable lost time. And he's going to have to work pretty hard. He's got to go through the process of warming up tyres once again. They may or may not have been scuffed up. Shouldn't be looking at us. We're, We're watching you. So he has a, a fair amount to do with uh, tyre problems. Meantime, George Fury in the number 30 Nissan Skyline continues to set quite a handy pace at the front of the field. Graham Crosby, there's the gap. Our race leader back to second. Fury goes across the line, Graham Crosby running in second, and on our head-on shot, you'll notice also back behind them, Dickie Johnson just falling away just a little bit for third. At I think the, the real drive so far is Charlie O'Brien, who's come up into fourth place in car number seven, the BMW, so George Fury leads, and he is in fine shape at the moment, but Charlie O'Brien in the 635 BMW has gone past Peter McLeod, who in turn previously had gone past Alan Moffat, and is a long way ahead of the factory BMWs at this stage. Johnson very confident that the car can keep circulating all day, so perhaps, uh, so perhaps that's uh, that's not a bad thing for him. As we look at the race leader George Fury at the moment, they're probably fitting right into Johnson's game plan that he can sit back third behind uh, the likes of Fury and Crosby, set the pace out front. Okay, well, the obvious uh, drama of the opening few laps. An unscheduled pit stop for Alan Moffat. With more details on that, Colin Young is in the pits. And tyre problems for Alan Moffat and the Holden dealer team Commodore in the first few laps. This is the rear tyre from the left-hand side of Moffat's uh, Commodore. As you can see, it's blistered all the way around. The rubber is so soft you can just peel it off with your fingers. And all the way around the left-hand rear tyre of Alan Moffat's Commodore with these uh, bad blisters. And this is the reason for Moffat's early pit stop. Back to you, Mike. Thank you, Colin. Well, obviously, uh, they have some tyre problems there. I have it doesn't do it on the second batch. No, that's pretty unusual. You don't see that too often. Obviously, some sort of an irregularity in the tyre because you should be able to go straight out of the race once it's been scuffed up and get down to a racing temperature in the tyre and go for it. But George Fury now finding himself in amongst traffic, and that'll obviously play a major part in this race. That's Greg Whitaker in the Toyota. David Radcliffe also being gobbled up by George on the way through. And David Bort about to come under attack in the front wheel drive Toyota Corolla that was formerly campaigned by John Smith and Drew Price earlier this season. You would gather that those drivers are having some problems as well because there was only 10 seconds uh, between uh, Fury on pole at uh, 115.2 and Clinton at the back of the grid on 125.4 so certainly Fury shouldn't have been grabbing the back markers that quickly so already this becoming a race of attrition with plenty of cars in trouble. So out of Brian Burke Ford corner there's George Fury, and it won't be too long before Fury gets up to put a lap on Alan Moffat. Georgie Fury, 41 years of age, comes from Tal Malmo in New South Wales, and this is the Skylight, second in the Australian Touring Car Championship for this year. Of course, ran second in the 85 Castrol, second in the 83 Touring Car title, third in the 83 Endurance Championship. And look at that rally performance, 77 and 80, the Australian Rally Champion. Georgie Fury, man in a hurry. My goodness me, he's in a hurry today here at Surface Paradise and the Peter Jackson is in Skyline and has a 3.9 second lead over Graham Crosby in the Commodore 
who in turn has 3.7 seconds in hand over Dickie Johnson in third spot. And then we go back to Charlie O'Brien in fourth place. George Fury to the right-hander at Kelly Springfield. Interesting thing for the Nissan team this weekend will be just how reliable the cars are going to be. They are going in fact to do uh, six hours of testing tomorrow in the number 15 car to ensure that they're ready for the Caswell 500 and the James Hardy 1000. Fury coming out of the two right-handers onto the main straight. They had some problems with their 15 car earlier in the series, but let's take a look at the Castrol scoreboard. Compliments of digital Fury leads from Graham Crosby and in third, Queensland's Dickie Johnson. Welcome back to the BP Plus 300 from Surface Paradise International Raceway. The man we're following at the moment is Charlie O'Brien in car number seven. Started from... Uh, from uh, well down, position number eight in the pack, but he has been the big mover so far, Neil Crock. He's come up very well. He's now only 4.7 seconds behind Dick Johnson in third position and closing the gap ever so slowly. With some, and has he got some problems? Yes, he I slowed think. the car down then. Um, so he's in fourth position at the moment. Behind him, Peter McLeod, then Jim Richards, and then Bradley Jones in the Starion, but the car is coasting at the moment. He had a very nasty accident on Friday when the car went off the fast left-hander up the back straight and disappeared into the grass. Damaged the front end, but he's now coasting into the pits with a problem, so... We'll find out we've got Colin Young in the pits, so he'll be able to uh, advise us. Meantime, Peter McLeod having a great dust-up with Richards. There's Brad Jones in car 53, sharing this weekend with Akahiko Nakaya, and behind him, Tony Longhurst in the 325 BMW. So this is a great performance from the Mitsubishi Shell Rally Art team. They uh, have, in actual fact, only had two outings in this car this year, apart from their little uh, uh, debacle down in Adelaide where they had problems with the car with turbos and tyre hassles in the Touring Car Championship, but he finished fourth in round one of the Endurance Championship at Amaru Park. The car then was sliding pretty wildly, and they feel that they've cured a few of the problems this weekend, and uh, they've done a quite a remarkable job. Charlie O'Brien in the pits in the 635BM. The problem appears to be from the power plant. That'll be very disappointing for the big Queenslander who got off to a flying start in the Bavarian Motorsport entry. As you said, Neil, they've done a great job to uh, piece the car back together after a nasty accident uh, in practice earlier in the week. He said, uh, Charlie said it is quite scary to sit there and watch uh, the disc brakes uh, sail past you about 25 feet from the car, travelling at uh, around about 90 or 100 mile an hour. OK, let's go down the pits. Cole Young, what seems to be the problem? Well, certainly uh, engine troubles for Charlie O'Brien. In fact, Charlie is now getting out of the car, and I'd say the BP300 is all over for Charlie O'Brien. Problems with the car late in uh, practice with the engine troubles. But now Charlie stepping out of the car, and uh, we might just grab a few words with Charlie. What's the problem? Oh, I think it may have broken a rocker or something like that. It's uh, dropped onto five cylinders, but uh, everything else, the temperatures, I think, are OK. So it's obviously just something at the top end of the engine. OK, Charlie O'Brien, a bad weekend in the BP300. Back to you, Mike. Thank you, Colt. And uh, meantime, this uh, great scrap continues between Brad Jones and the Mitsubishi Starion and uh, the young line of the BMW JPS team, and that's Tony Longhurst. Uh, they've been hard at it for the last uh, five laps of the race. We also noted earlier uh, that Jimmy Richards got away to a, to a mild start. They went off the circuit, so he's had to catch up a lot of ground. That will affect uh, perhaps any chance he has of getting to uh, George Fury early in the race. However, the pit stops could actually determine the outcome of this event. Indeed, and the Mitsubishi Starium will have to make a pit stop at around about the halfway mark, whereas the 25 car of Tony Longhurst is expecting at this stage to go right through on one set of tyres and it has sufficient capacity, 110 litres, to take it through. That's according to the theory, as Frank said this morning, they may have to come in for the little security uh, top up with, say, five laps to go. But that, in reality, sees Tony Longhurst in a better position at the moment than Brad Jones. Certainly, and the other point is that Tony will uh, have to be a little sparing with the tyres on the 325. It's also the last run in Australia today for this car. It's going to New Zealand shortly to be run by Ed Lamont, so from here on in we'll see Tony in the 635, and indeed Jim Richards' car today is a brand new car wheeled out just uh, earlier this week. 
So Jim Richards uh, with a brand new car, the little 325 on its way, and the old 635 BMW has also been sold. It's off to New Zealand and will be driven by Trevor Crowe. And Trevor, you'll recall when we covered the Wellington Street race on 7 Sport, teamed up very effectively with Tony Longhurst. And speaking of travelling, the car in front will also be travelling, or uh, one similar. The Starians will be racing in Japan next week in the same combination. Jones and Hiko Nakaya will head over there and uh, you may remember that interview I did a little earlier on in the show uh, with Hiko I asked him um, how did he find Brad as a co-driver and uh, as is their way the Japanese gentleman way he said uh, he is not my co-driver I am his co-driver this afternoon it may be a different story next week <laughs> I tell you who is carrying on still in third place is our old mate Dickie Johnson in car number 17 carrying our, our seven race camp and there is the view out the front of the uh, Motorcraft Shell Exmo Mustang V8. At the track early this week, around Wednesday, they brought the car down for extensive testing. Of course, the new co-driver is Greg Hansen, as we all know, as we passed Lester Smurden in the Highway Patrol Commodore, ripped past him to remain in a solid third place. And we mean solid now with Charlie O'Brien. His race is run, and he was the man challenging or getting a little closer to uh, Dick Johnson. Uh, of course, as we said, we'll see Greg Hansford at the wheel of the 17 Palmer Tube Mills Mustang a little later on this afternoon, and it's shaping as a great combination for the Endurance Series, including Bathurst. Coming out of Brian Bird Ford Corner once again onto the start finishing straight. The race order still the same. George Fury leading from Graham Crosby. Well, Dickie Johnson hanging in there. There's Dickie, and the interesting thing is that he's been hit by one spot because, in actual fact, uh, I think Graham Bailey's up there having a bit of a dust-up with him. But Dick Johnson hard at work at the wheel. Dick, how's things out there at the moment? Oh, mate, I tell you what, I'm starting to feel the wog on me now. Yeah. <laughs> but it's pretty evident. I tell you what, with the way the budget's been going, there's no Volvos in front of us. I don't think they can afford the tax. <laughs> oh, you're a wicked man, Dick. No. <laughs> You got off to a pretty good start, mate. Mate, she was a boomer start. And actually the tyres are hanging in quite good at the minute, which is surprising. Dick, third on the racetrack at the moment. This will be going uh, right according to plan, as far as you're concerned. Yeah, too right, except for my health, mate. I tell you, I feel like I've been a wet sponge that's been in the oven. So I reckon I reckon we'll give old Greg a bit of a, a steer pretty shortly, I can tell you. So if, you, if you're not feeling the best, how is that then going to throw the plans out for the race? Had you planned on a pit stop at half distance, Dick? Yeah, we are going to, but it doesn't matter. Greg's just as quick as me. And, you know, he'll, he'll, he, he can get in and the car will run 60-odd laps. All I've got to do is try and make 20-odd laps. Tell me this, you're, uh, I know it hasn't been widely publicised, but you have a great deal of faith in Greg Hansford. You consider... Getting him to your uh, team for next year is quite a curve. Well, he's the same physical size as me, and the guy has the same nature, so you're not trying to promote a watermelon. Oh, terrific, yeah. <laughs> and he fits in the seat belts. We don't change a damn thing. And he's got a pretty good sense of humour too, which is real important in this game, I tell you. The new tyres today, Dick, obviously they're holding up very well. I'm very pleased with them so far. They've been extremely well. It's the first time I've ever been in a, in a car when it's understeered. Well, you're running, you're running third on the road at the moment. George Fury still in front. Uh, Graham Crosby settled down into second. And you for third. Do you think the, uh, perhaps the, the Commodore brake problem might uh, show its head before the end of this race? Well, I don't know, because uh, I don't know what's happened to Marvin, but he's not here anymore. No, he had some tyre problems. He's gone in for a, for a pit stop. And in fact, as we talk, George Fury just puts a lap on him. Oh, what a blow. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'll let you get on with the get, get on with the flu, and we'll come back to you a bit later. Thanks, pal. OK, mate. Dickie Johnson. Dickie Johnson in car number 17. Still running third on the road at the moment. And of course, the race... Well, as we check the Castrol scoreboard covering the BP300, it will show that Georgie Fury is your race leader. Graham Crosby in second, and Tricky Dicky in third.
back here at the BP 300 plus at Surface Paradise International Raceway, the 1985 Australian Touring Car Champion Jimmy Richards in the black Bavarian beauty is up to fourth on the racetrack after a so-so start and then going off the circuit in the opening half lap of the race. Give you some idea of the gaps between the top five at the moment. Fury has an eight second lead over Graham Crosby. He in turn has eight seconds over Dickie Johnson. It's five and a half seconds back to this man here, Jimmy Richards, and then another 6.4 down to Peter McLeod, followed by Tony Longhurst and Bradley Jones. So uh, the essence of that story is they're spread out like Brown's cows. All the dice is early on have fizzed a little. And Jim Richards, the 1985 Australian Touring Car Champion, and indeed the reigning Australian Endurance Champion, and this car is the reigning uh, mark for the winning car from last year, climbing his way back through the field in a new helmet and a new driving suit this weekend. And a new car. Yeah, and a new car. So looking pretty good. The BMWs are going to be a real thorn in the side of the major teams throughout this endurance championship. Well, that's 21 and a half seconds behind the race leader, George Fury. If you have just joined us, you may have seen Gary Scott's car pulled off to the side of the road, car number 15. He broke a drive shaft on car number uh, 15 on lap one. John Smith didn't start, he had a problem with his Toyota pulled off to the side of the road and Alan Moffat pitted on lap 6 with a blistered tyre, so some of the heavies have gone out with problems early. Well, Jimmy Richards, of course, were followed throughout the uh, season of the Touring Car Championship and one must give credit to Frank Gardner and the JPS BMW team because they are present at all the motor races throughout the season. They don't hand-pick their races and I'm quite sure Jim Richards would agree. The, uh, the car has got better and better as each meeting has gone on. Frank does a lot of uh, midweek testing on the car, so naturally we can try out what he does at each meeting we go to. But for me to, uh, to be doing such a lot of miles, it is good. You get used to the car, uh, you get used to every little thing it does, so you get to be as one. And the same with the team. They, uh, they know exactly what to do when we come into a small problem or a small adjustment. Because we're doing all these miles, the uh, the team works better and well together. Is it disappointing for you as a driver to trek halfway across the country and then find some of the other major teams have elected to stay at home? Um, no, not really. Uh, I think uh, we try and do the whole series as a whole. Um, if you're going to chase a championship, you've got to do every every round. But uh, if the others stay at home, well, it's uh, it's their problem, not ours. Jimmy Richards talking there with Phil Harrison. Yes, the ever-present man of the Australian motorsport scene. Not only Jim at the wheel, but also Tony Longhurst in the backup uh, JPS 325 BMW. And the man uh, controlling the team, Frank Gardner, doing a good job for the mark here in Australia. And I think they'll have a very competitive race car and certainly a competitive team by the time that James Hardy comes around in October. Michael, only quarter distance at the moment and uh, the circuit now bathed in bright sunshine for the first time today. But nevertheless, the weather is still building up a little bit over to that southwesterly area and uh, that is a man to watch, Jim Richards, if in fact we do get a little rain this afternoon. A great wet weather driver as we know. Yes, wet feet. It helps. <laughs> but he's good on, uh, I think a bit of a fallacy. Uh, everyone played at that for some years about, you know, Three storm clouds came over a circuit. They expected Jim to run across the lake or something. He's just as good in the dry as he is in the wet. Well, one of the things that I'm uh, checking at the moment is the pace at which Graham Crosby is lapping out, just to see whether or not he's losing any ground on the leader. They're all getting around at the moment in around about uh, 118. So there's Frank Gardner, team manager for the JPS team. So they're a little outside their qualifying pace, as one would understand early in the race, with 120 litres of fuel on board and very hard compound tyres. Although Richards yesterday did use the, um, the D4 17-inch Pirelli tyres on their 17-inch rims. So at the moment we've got Jimmy Richards just tapping brakes going into the fast left-hander, but certainly I think the story of this race so far has been one of... Uh, problems for a lot of the leading contenders. Remember I said before, Gary Scott out before he even moved 10 feet in the Nissan Skyline. Alan Moffat into the pits on lap six. I've also just noticed in the last few moments that Bradley Jones is slipping back down through the field in car number 53. There's Graham Crosby in second position in the Bob Jane T-Mart's Holden Commodore. And he's now virtually giving an entire straight length away to race leader George Fury. As Crosby comes onto the top of the straight, Fury disappears underneath the bridge. So I've just got the clock on Crosby again to check his lap times, but he's certainly been holding station pretty comfortably. 
Crosby through the right-hander. This car had a few problems in the lead-up to this race. Wayne Wilkinson from New Zealand is due to co-drive the car at the Castrol 500 and um, also the James Hardy 1000. And on Thursday, when on only his second lap in the race, he uh, shot out onto the circuit to try and uh, settle himself into the car. He speared off up the top and completely knocked the front end of the car around after they just rebuilt it and spent a lot of time on this car in the last uh, six or seven weeks. They also blew an engine on the Friday. And what we have here, of course, is our race leader, George Fury, in car number 30. He put a lap on Alan Moffat earlier. Now, Moffat has been able to come back and take back that passing manoeuvre. But George is very keen to get on with the business and put, put that lap back on Alan again as they come down the start finishing straight. Little Peter Jackson, this and Scarlett whistling to the outside. Moffat elects the inside run to the turn. And George going in very, very deep indeed. Keeping in mind he's protecting at this stage a nine-second gap over Graham Crosby and coming down on the inside keeping in mind we also have uh, race cam pictures and in Alan Moffat's car we'll show you Alan at the wheel during the course of the race today and of course when uh, Peter Brock takes over the car at the moment a very interesting uh, scrap going on here a fellow who probably wouldn't be too happy considering the way things have turned out snaring the front row starting spot is uh, the Peter Jackson Nissan team's Gary Scott, who joins us. He's still got a smile on his face, though. That's right, Mike. But um, very disappointing. The um, Something broke in the driveline assembly, and um, we didn't even move. It's um, very disappointing, because as you can see on the screen, George is leading comfortably. He's having a bit of trouble with uh, Moffat, but uh, I think that's a temporary uh, impediment at the moment. Well, Alan has fought very hard to get back past George again. Uh, yeah. What would you be doing in, uh, in George's shoes? Just trying to get rid of your this problem and they get on with the race and open a break again that's right mike you you try and set, settle yourself into a rhythm and just do things easily and um, consistently moffat's giving george a very hard time and i've just come up from our pits and we're on the, the two-way system and uh, i think fred gibson's getting quite an earful from george he's uh, i know he's getting quite upset and agitated with moff because he's giving him uh, no room at all and in fact moffat is a lap behind and george is um, losing about a second and a half a lap this dice is slowing him up and all, all along Crosby's sort of edging closer to us. George won't be happy so it's going to be interesting to see what he does in this situation. Well, what's George's temperament like? He hardly shows any emotion at all is he a little volatile when he gets on the two way? <laughs> well I, I think most of it's unprintable but um, <laughs> I think he, his, his opinion is coming across loud and clear I believe well, disappointment for you uh, for something to go wrong like that, but uh, obviously as a teammate, uh, we'd be satisfied with certainly the way that George has got off the line and the way he's been able to dictate the pace of this race so far. That's right, Mike. The cars this weekend have been comfortable all weekend. Um, you will recall Mo Moffat had it and Brock had it over us last time here. That hasn't been the case this time. The cars have improved both technically and in their speed, and um, really there's been nothing to get near us. We qualified yesterday on old race tyres, and in fact, never even use qualifying tyres. You should explain, that's Freddie Gibson, team manager for the Peter Jackson Nissan team, and uh, when Gary said he's getting an earful from uh, George Fury, that's exactly who he was talking to then. So this scrap continues, and George's lead 8.8 seconds, incidentally, over Crosby at the moment. But he's still been able to hold that because I think Graham, uh, at this stage, uh, I think is running at uh, the pace that he's happy running at. I can't see Graham coming with a big charge, but George, certainly just trying to uh, get past Alan Moffat. We're staying with this great scrap. Ooh. But anyway, George, I tell you what, Alan's got plenty of uh, mirrors full of uh, George Fury at this stage. They're getting fed ink, aren't they? We'll follow uh, the scrap. There's Alan Moffat behind the wheel. See behind the wheel, you, you don't see all this, this wonderful mirrors magic of television. Are we, are we not there now, are we? No, we're not. No. <laughs> Don't you dare say anything. <laughs> we're just watching the, uh, the style of Moffat with uh, George Fury sitting right in behind him. They're coming up uh, on a couple of slower cars. Still eight and a half seconds to break at this stage. I was going to suggest we should cross to him and ask him what he's thinking at the moment. No, no, we wouldn't even do that. You'll make a good television director one day. They come down the strip uh, if I get the words out, start finishing straight. Moffat's still clear. Look at this. 
I said, do you think this was a 100k sprint race? Didn't you these? And they're racing for a sheep station as well. So Alan Moffat in the 0-5 uh, Commodore and uh, George Fury, the race leader, in the number 30 Peter Jackson, this in Skyline Turbo. Down towards IPEC corner, down the run down the back straight. We'll get the split for you next time they go across the line. Fury coming on strong here. I don't know where the other Commodore was, I don't think he was frightened off the track. That was uh, Gerald Kay. Yes, George finds himself in a very difficult position, I think, at the moment, because he can't afford to button off too much, because Proz is lurking, although it is almost nine seconds. And Moffat's got his own race to run, he's got to recover that ground. He's almost one lap down on the leader. And Peter Brock standing by in the pits to hopefully jump in the car about half race distance. It's an important shakedown for the dealer team. And Moffat, I guess, similarly doesn't want to just button off and lose valuable ground, so a little perplexing. Incidentally, the gap between Crosby and Johnson, 7.7 seconds as we take race cam and look at Alan Moffat working hard, looking in the mirror, trying to cover his ground. We're up to lap 30, and now Fury dives from about behind the slipstream, tries to go around the long way, which is pretty difficult under the bridge, but hopes, of course, to tighten up his entry into the right-hander down at IPEC. problems early in the season with uh, some handling with the, with the skyline, Gary, but uh, things seem to be uh, improving all the time. They're going ahead in leaps and bounds, Mike, you're correct there. The car was only new and that's it was teething problems, that were the initial problems, but now it's a very lovely car, to, a very nice car to drive and Fred Gibson and the team are doing an excellent job of developing it into a race winning combination. Just to break away from that at, uh, for one brief moment, I've also noticed down in the pits in front of me, Greg Hansford is togged up and in a standby position for, for a possible stop from Dick Johnson by the look of it. So we'll watch that one with great interest. There is Hansford, togged up, and uh, we'll go into the number 17 Mustang and uh, hopefully try his first race cam experience with us later on this afternoon. So perhaps Dick's health not as good as he hoped and they're not going to do that uh, 45 odd laps that he originally anticipated doing. Well, one man that's getting uh, very keen to get on with this is Georgie Fury. They work the front straight here in the BP Plus 300 at Surface Paradise. And the long legs of the Commodore holding sway halfway down the straight. Georgia again going in wide, tucking back in as they work this very long and continuing corner down to IPEC. Cast your mind back a couple of years ago, these two certainly had no love lost when they were battling, I think, in 1983 or perhaps oh. four. But then there's Dick Johnson to the pits now. The man that was placed third in the race. He was only 1.4 seconds ahead of Jim Richards at the last check that I gave, so he obviously felt he was losing a little time. Hansford goes in. Four tyres, which should be the end of any tyre problems that they're likely to have now through to the end of the race. A good stop. An excellent stop from the Palmer team. And Greg Hansford, his first racing miles at the Ford Mustang as we go back to leader George Fury, still battling with Alan Moffat. Yes, I was about to say that about three or even four years ago, these two had some memorable battles when Moffat was in the Mazda RX-7 and George in the Bluebird. The two manufacturers were fighting out for the manufacturer's title, so there was a lot at stake, and I think we're probably seeing a little bit of that boil over once again. George Fury, the leader, on lap 31 of the BP Plus 300, round two of the Australian Endurance Championship for touring cars, and Alan Moffat desperately trying to make up some ground. In fact, you can see Graham Crosby in the background in the orange Bob Jane T-Mart's entry. We've got another split going shortly and see whether or not Fury is now starting to be held up to the degree that Crosby is closing. A fascinating uh, dice this between uh, Alan Moffat and, of course, race leader George Fury in the number 30 Skyline Turbo. Surprised me that Commodore still got a bit of grunt at the end of the straight, Gary. Yes, uh, Mike, they seem very similar in their top end speed. Uh, my, um, Alan's doing a, a very good defensive drive here. You, <laughs> you can. The man's experience is showing through in this situation. There would be very few drivers that would withstand this pressure and get through traffic and still stay in front, um, even though he is being a little naughty at times. <laughs> is that naughty only if you drive a Skyline? <laughs> we all want to win. Yes, um, I know. We all apply varying degrees of wanting to win, I think, in situations like this. But really, uh, if I was in George's shoes, 
he, he would know he can only lose this situation. He has everything to lose. Moffat has nothing to lose. And I think you'll find he will sit there and just pick the time if he can cleanly. But he would be getting concerned of the, the amount of uh, heat he'd be building up from sitting that close behind another car. You can see him ducking out into the airstream there. But uh, he'll be wanting to get on with the job very shortly. Well, the reason that he is starting to push a bit harder is Crosby is now 6.1 seconds behind leader George Fury, having pulled up two and a half seconds in the last three laps. Well, they work their way through IPEC quarter onto the back straight. What a fascinating dice. Hope it's still there when we return. George Fury leads this race from Graham Crosby and Jimmy Richards is still third. Welcome back. To the BP 300 plus at surfers and just look at this scrap it continues with Georgie Fury the race leader still trying to peg and put a lap back on Alan Moffat Moffat refuses to give way as uh, Gary Scott who was with us um, for a few minutes prior to the break explained I guess if you're a Nissan driver you, <laughs> you take it all to heart but uh, also the point that Neil Crompton made that Moffat has got a job to do he's got to hand over to Peter Brock and at this moment he is absolutely driving flat strap in car number five at the moment, the mobile Commodore probably back into the top ten after that lightning pit stop. But George getting closer all the time and now coming down the outside. Oh, this is a moment as Moffat goes in. Is George going to go in even tighter on the outside of him? And this will be the pass of the day. Make no mistake if it comes off. But it's not going to come off because Moffat's not going to give way. This is probably Moffat's finest performance, I believe, in the Commodore. It's back to Alan the racer. There's no doubt about it as they swing into Brian Burt, forward corner. And down in the pit area, Colin Young and Peter Brock are watching all this action on the monitor. Brock, he must be impressed, Cole. He certainly is, Mike. A very interested spectator, Peter Brock. What do you think of the dice between George and Alan? Oh, it's, it's embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh. the boy, my, young, my protege, Alan, is doing very well up the main straight. He's blocking him again. It's tremendous. I'm wrapped. <laughs> well, Peter, uh, George apparently is complaining to Freddie Gibson that yeah. Alan's actually holding him up. I bet he is. Yeah, it's great. Well, you had to make an early tyre stop, at least Alan did, so yeah. that's put you a little bit back. So uh, what are the tactics from here? Uh, well, Alan will come in around about uh, lap 40, 42, thereabouts, and uh, I'll get in the car and just go as fast as I can to the end of the race. So, well, you know, it's a chance. There's no doubt about that. And uh, what about uh, the Commodore? In other respects, tyre problems, any other troubles? Well, the, the Touring Car Championship race we did here about two months ago, uh, we had no tyre problems and we ran uh, you know, at such a speed that we reckon it's as fast as it is at. So, we'll wait to see today. Okay, thanks Peter Brock and Peter Brock a happy man the way Alan Moffat is driving the Commodore in the BP 300. Thank you Colin Young. Well, he might have taken a set back then when George pulled the number of all on uh, Alan to take back, uh, well, maintain his lead and try and get it open to a healthy gap over Graham Crosby. <laughs> For the amount of times that uh, poor old uh, Peter plays on the, the Datsun, uh, George Fury uh, extending that lead, already opening it up to Graham Crosby. Here's a fellow who's been running strongly, Neil Crompton, Tony Longhurst in the number 25, JPS BMW. Longhurst is in fourth position at the moment behind his teammate Jim Richards, lap 36 of 85 in the BP plus 300. That's a pretty fine performance from him. I just noticed a couple of moments ago the Mitsubishi Starion of Brad Jones and Akihiko Nakaya has gone in and out of the pits and the Japanese driver is now in. So the advantage that I spoke of earlier in the race of the BMW being able to go through on one set of tyres and potentially one tank load of fuel is now working well in its favour. And it's the highest placed uh, Class A car, as this one is, and fourth outright on the road, which is a fine performance. The last drive for Tony in the 325 this year, as I said earlier, Keeping in mind those pit stop plans, uh, a great chance for Longhurst to uh, move a lot higher up and even take over control of the race when uh, the three bigger cars have to uh, make their uh, their pit stops. Yeah, and that's the other thing that'll work in Jim's favour as well because they're also expecting to take the 635 through on one on, on no stops, just right through the race, um, which has got to be worth almost a minute by the time you allow for 20 or 30 seconds for the stop, the slowdown and the speed up process. Not only that, but the uh, the BMW 325 has been just so competitive in Europe this year, winning Voigt, running the uh, the factory effort. And I tell you what, I don't think there's a round of the European Championship that uh, Voigt in the 325 hasn't finished in the top 10. 
and more often than not he's up in the top five well tony's nearest rival at the moment is murray carter in the everlast car 36 nissan skyline and he's got a seven second lead over him so he's doing it easily Oops. and there's nakaya off the circuit car number 53 Mitsubishi Starion with extra backing this weekend from Citizen and he's learning a little more about the Australian geography well back on the circuit and I guess as far as the Mitsubishi is concerned the little ninja is about to give it some ginger <laughs> well, he'll pull out his knives after that I'm sure to try and regain some lost territory Tony Longhurst surviving the battle earlier with Brad Jones and Colin Bond is a couple of positions further back than these two drivers so Longhurst has really got it quite comfortably on his own at the moment. Speaking of Longhurst earlier in the week he was saying uh, he doesn't enjoy the reputation as being one of the circuit's hard drivers. Uh, he, uh, he denies it in fact, says that um, because he is driving the, uh, the little one the little of the uh, the little of the BMWs that uh, he has to push himself and the car right over the limit to uh, stay up with the bigger vehicles and uh, the only way he can pass is on the corners and that's where he has to make his moves and uh, that's why he does look very spectacular when he's out there. Well, Tony Longhurst in fourth position and the man that he battled with earlier on in this race was Brad Jones in the Mitsubishi Starion. He's come in for a pit stop. Japanese driver Akihiko Nakaya went into the car. Here's a replay of what happened down towards Ipec Corner. Shot off into the dirt, ran wide and had a big lose. And he would have been doing a good 160 miles an hour down there in front of Graham Crosby. Second outright in the race at the moment. But he held it very nicely. No damage to the car. Check to make sure everything was okay as we come back live. Looking at Crosby, in fact, now still battling with Alan Moffat. Well, in fact, Crosby uh, still holding down that uh, second spot on the road behind George Fury, so he's effectively been able to uh, uh, work his way past Alan Moffat. Just ahead of them is uh, Graham Bailey in the Chickadee Commodore. So Alan Moffat in car number 05 still to hand over to Peter Brock. The car still running in the top ten. Crosby no doubt relieved that he didn't have the same troubles as George Fury as uh, getting past the 05 Commodore. Crosby doing a fine performance this weekend. In fact, his qualifying performance was superb too. It was the sixth lap of the second session when the Nissan's the Nissan team were super confident that they had it wrapped up, that they had uh, pole and number two spot wrapped up with the brilliant performances in the first two sessions. And then Crosby just snuck out. And the Nissans uh, caught the Nissans a little bit off guard, in fact, because they had qualifying tyres. They uh, recorded their real quick times on just race tyres, but they had qualifying tyres ready to go. Didn't think they'd need them to hold one and two, so they decided to save a bit of rubber. And then all of a sudden, Cros came out reeled off that sensational 15-2 lap and that grabbed him uh, second spot on the grid right beside George and he's held second spot right the way throughout the afternoon and a very very solid drive so far. It certainly has been Paddock. Well, Alan Moffat back running in Australia. This is his first meeting for the mobile dealer team in Australia and of course coming back here to Surface Paradise for the BP Plus 300 today means that the mobile team has in fact uh, ditched their last European appearance in um, the uh, big classic to be held at uh, Silverstone, the uh, British Tourist Trophy, on the 7th of September. Alan Moffat's back, but maybe just slightly disappointed not finishing off in Europe. We did sh uh, shortcut ourselves one race by not going to Silverstone on September the 7th, but we thought that was just leaving us a bit too tight for the Hardy Auto 1000. Uh, we still have a 500 kilometre race at Fuji in Japan uh, after Bathurst, well, after the Australian Grand Prix, and that will be our final run. The form finish at Spa must have been an exciting event for you. Um, looking forward to the same situation at Bathurst? Uh, that would be ideal, but I think the level of competition is going to be so strong at Bathurst that we're going to have to drive two cars flat to the board, and uh, if, uh, if one of them gets home, we'll be happy with one. I don't think we could get two of them home in a form finish. <laughs> Alan Moffat speaking there with uh, Phil Harrison. They're still running in the top ten. And Peter Brock still to come in the 05 car. Meantime, Georgie Fury in car number 30 still continues to set the pace for the Peter Jackson Nissan team. As they work the bottom part of the course, let's recap on the scoreboard. George Fury, the race leader over Graham Crosby and Jimmy Richards in third of the BP Plus 300 from Surfers. BP 300 Plus continues at Surface Paradise. 
from the time it took us to take that uh, brief commercial pause. Alan Moffat straight into the pits and Peter Brock into the race car. So Brocky is back out there on the racetrack having his first taste of action for today. Still running in the top 10 on the road, but I tell you what, he's still got a lot of work to do. And it might be uh, timely to also have a look at the, the way that Peter Brock works at his job as a chauffeur inside the car. We've been following Alan Moffat. And now this will give you an opportunity. It's very it's a rare occurrence when we uh, get to have a camera inside uh, one of Peter Brock's cars to show you how relaxed he is at the wheel or how intense he is uh, in an endurance race. Halfway distance completed, the VP300 and Brocky at the wheel. So now going through the very fast sweeping left-hander in the Holden Commodore with the advantage over Alan Moffat now with a fresh set of tyres. The, one of the slower corners on the circuit, the tight right-hander, Kelly Springfield. And still really finding his race pace at the moment. You can hear the notation of the engine in the background not really humming and singing like it was when Alan was in the car, but once he's got a little more warmth into those tyres, Brock will be right into it, and these Commodores do sound sensational. Just have a listen. Really roaring down the straight behind Murray Carter and one of the Anderson brothers, Mustang. Acknowledges his pit crew into fifth gear for the brave charge under the bridge. Watch the way Brock gets rocked around in the car under here. Points it in, corrects the slide. Watch the back of the car on the other shot. You'll see just how much these cars move on the road. Look at his body lurching forward as he applies very hard braking through the right-hander. Past Anderson's Mustang. Now behind Carter has a glance in the mirror. One of the things that Alan Moffat said to us yesterday was that he was surprised how much he looks in the mirror. He doesn't even realise that he's doing it, but it's a subconscious thing that the driver has to do. He doesn't want to block another driver, and of course he has to watch out in case anybody else is on the attack. Rounds up Murray Carter. And that takes you for a lap around Service Paradise, 3.2 kilometres, riding with Peter Brock and looking at both aspects of the way that it's done. Well, the pit area has been a busy area for the last uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. There's uh, George Fury in the Nissan, straight in, fuel, tyres, and straight back out again. We'll see what he's been able to hold that buffer over uh, uh, maybe even the fourth place driver, uh, Tony Longhurst. No, he hasn't. So he's dropped the lead to Graham Crosby at this yes. stage of the race. But in the pits with Cole is Alan Moffat. OK, thanks very much. And it's uh, been a busy pit area. We've just seen uh, the Nissan Skyliner George Fury in. But with me is Alan Moffat. And Alan, a great dice there with George Fury. Well, great for him. But compliments to him. He, he nibbled away at me. Uh, we waved at each other a couple of times. He got a bit cheeky a couple of times. I was cheeky all the time. I was holding him under the bridge well i had to it was too dangerous there's only one line under the bridge but uh he just waited to the right time and he kept breaking across on the straight and he took it uh, to his credit under the, under the toughest circumstances the message back to fred gibson from george there was that he wasn't too happy that you might have been holding him up a lap down yes but we're also in the race and i took that into consideration i would have been cheesed off as well but we were very comfortable on times and it was only when my left rear went totally off that he actually was able to get me it's a uh, very hairy going under the bridge but you can't rely on your left tire all the weight goes onto that corner and uh, i would say probably only until the very last four or five laps that i genuinely held him up. so uh fair fight yes it was a fair fight unfortunately front so he can take the laurels. Okay, Alan, you had tire troubles early. Uh, You've got what a puncture. It, you, can't, you can't live without air in the tires. And uh, I, I thought I was imagining it and tried to persevere for two or three laps when I saw the others disappearing. And I had a semi-lose going under the bridge. I said, oh, it wasn't worth it time-wise. Come in to get rid of it. I mean, it would have just caused an accident. Alan Moffat from the Holden dealer team. Peter Brock now out in the car. George Fury's made his pit stop. So it's a race to the flag. Graham Bailey's been in for his second unscheduled stop. Back to you, Mike. Yes, and we have uh, the race leader. Thanks, Cole. Graham Crosby coming in. We'll keep a, an eye on what happens now as the race leader heads down to his pit lane. Well, Jim Richards has gone by and now inherits the lead. So an ever-familiar black BMW leads the field as Crosby's in. And I've had the watch running since he first made the approach run to give you a true indication of the time that he's lost. 
the Bob Jane team arts crew very quick Wayne Wilkinson getting in the car New Zealand driver who last year drove with Graham Bouquet in the sleepyhead Commodore and Bouquet of course was at uh, uh, Spa a couple of weeks ago in with Neil Lowe and Kent Bajan Dunlop radial tyres going on to the Bob Jane entry George Fury has also gone by so they've lost a couple of spots and Tony Longhurst now coming down by the side of the pits as well so there go three of the placings they're now ready to drop the car off the jacks Crosby's clear of the car it fires up they've lost 50 51 seconds and you're still losing time when you're driving out of the pits so Wayne Wilkinson now leaves he's lost 58 seconds before regaining any sort of race pace as we look at Jim Richards now the new race leader of the BP plus 300 in car number one the reigning endurance champion doing it again and he's also got a, a good break at this stage over George Fury in car number 30 and if uh, the JPS team have um, been able to tab all their homework into the right column and this car goes all the way to the flag I think we'll find that uh, George Fury is going to have to do a lot of chasing in the last uh, three quarters of an hour of this race. He is, and it'll be interesting now to see whether or not the BMW team can be pushed hard enough by the Nissan team to overextend their tyres and fuel consumption because the whole thing will come back into some sort of an equivalency. And there's the shot of the crew preparing for a stop. So obviously there's been some communication between Jim and team manager Frank Gardner and that may very much be the case now where they have to make the stop. So we're looking at a false economy at the moment although I will check the gap to see what it is between Jim and George. I thought you'd turn Keating on us for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> well with uh, Jim Richards now leading the race remains to be seen then with uh, Tony Longhurst. I've got a feeling then, uh, Tony Longhurst just flashed his lights down the front straight and I have a feeling from that shot that I saw before that they were the tires. narrower width yeah. tyres and it could very well be Tony who's coming in so we'll have to wait and see. Two cars in the team remember, it may not be Jim stopping. And that, that would be, well, a bit, yeah, Tony's yeah, tyres, so there we go. Yeah. The magic of television. Yes. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? So Tony Longhurst preparing for a pit stop has already signalled to Frank Gardner and the JPS BMW team that he is in. Next lap around. Meantime, gentlemen drum in the number one JPS BMW powers on, leading the BP Plus 300 from Surface Paradise. Looking for back-to-back -back wins, keeping in mind only three weeks ago he won at Amaru. There's the order. It's changed a little. Richards is now the race leader and leading at 12, Georgie Fury. Back at Surfers Paradise, we look at Murray Carter in car number 36. He was up in a fifth position in the Nissan Skyline. A great performance from the veteran driver, but they're now wasting time, I'd almost describe it as, because they've been in for a good 30 seconds. Now they're finally ready. Remove the air hose, and Carter, doing a solo run in this 300-kilometre race, rejoins the circuit and has probably lost about two spots, I'd say. We'll check the uh, top five or six for you in a few moments, but that was... A fairly ordinary stop from the Everlast team because they were in there for probably a good minute and a half by the time you extend their stop with the slowdown and speed back up. Well, Murray Carter, a veteran of um, Australian motor racing, doing this season with uh, Bill O'Brien with uh, sponsorship backing, Everlast Batteries, out of the Australian Capital Territory. And it's been a privateer's effort for Murray Carter. He mentioned to me uh, yesterday that uh, the effort of being of fielding the uh, Nissan Skyline as a privateer has probably absorbed over two hundred thousand dollars but uh, Murray is one of the longtime veterans of motorsport and he's enjoyed the last 25 years of his profession well the motor racing in those days was more of a, a club atmosphere uh, we had more social involvement with the competitors the cars were basically as production cars they weren't as sophisticated as what they are today. We could probably go motor racing on virtually a shoestring and uh, quite enjoy ourselves. And in those years, how many pounds, shillings and pence and dollars and cents would you have spent on motor racing? Well, a lot of people say to me, what does motor racing cost you? Well, at this stage, I'd say a lifetime. Murray Carter, some wise words there. And sitting in behind him, of course, is uh, Greg Hansford in the Dick Johnson Motorcraft Mustang V8. Coming down the start-finishing straight, Greg Hansford, as I mentioned, at the wheel. 
Murray Carter just ahead, but he's dropped uh, not only time during his pit stop, but a little off-track excursion, I'd say, when the tyres weren't warmed up. Lap 52, and Greg Hansford at the moment is up in the third position, trailing Jim Richards and George Fury. As we make it at this stage from the official lap scorers, Graham Crosby is into fourth position. Peter McLeod at the Auto Park Commodore is in fifth, and then Tony Longhurst, having just made his pit stop, is behind in the 325 BMW. So BM leading from Nissan, from Ford Mustang, Holden Commodore, another Commodore, and then the 325 BM. Still a very good mix of cars. And still a fair way to go in this race. And of course, driving the number 17 Dick Johnson Motorcraft Mustang today is Greg Hansford, one of the fastest men ever on two wheels and a mean hand at the wheel of a touring car. And it's good to have you aboard, Greg. Nice to talk to you. Thanks, Mike. That was a lovely introduction. Well, I'll take the money and run. <laughs> I haven't got any left. How do you find the car? You've driven just about every make round here. It's uh, very, very different from any other car I've ever driven. Uh, in the last few years, anyway, it's a, a big V8 engine, and I've always been used to an RX-7 Mazda. Hang on for a second. Greg Hansford coming up onto the back of David Mort from the front-wheel drive Corolla. This is a busy part of the track, so I don't blame him for taking some time out. Goes down now to the right-hander at IPEC, and he will gobble up the little car pretty Which quickly under brakes. Which way will he go? That's always the question of a race driver. He's going to wave you through on the inside by the look of it, Greg. Now you can outgun him. Some open space at last. I tell you who I think was in there by the look of the helmet. I think it was John Smith. So Greg Hansford. Talk to us again about taking the Mustang around Service Paradise for a lap. Greg's still a little busy at the moment. As he goes up to the right-hander at Kelly Springfield, I think he's cleared himself of the traffic, but he's lulled back into race driver mode. He's got his race face on and he's not listening to the waffling commentators. <laughs> so how, Greg, with the laps that you've had around here in practice, how competitive do you expect the, the little Mustang to, to be at Bathurst? Mike, I think it's going to be bloody terrific because it's, uh, I think, with the tyres the way they are and the way the, uh, the car's got the reliability, it could be there at the end of the race. And if you're not there then, well, you haven't got a chance of winning. But uh, the longer the race, I think, the better the car's going to be. You must have been quite happy with your pit stop. That was a world rule pit stop. It's probably the best one of the race so far. Yeah, well, we didn't do any good in practice. I think that we had to do it in the race, and that's, it went well, so... Obviously, with Dick coming in a little earlier, Greg, because he's suffering from the flu, didn't uh, didn't seem to worry you at all? Oh, no, it just makes it harder for me at the end, but uh, he thinks I'm fitter than he is, but he's got another thing to think about when I get out of the car. How is your fitness, Greg? Because it's pretty daunting driving one of these things. Um, I've been playing a lot of tennis and uh, trying to do as uh, much physical exercise as I can without having to go to the gym every day. But... Uh, the best uh, exercise you can get is driving the car and uh, unfortunately it costs a, a lot of money to be able to come down here every day of the week and you're looking at thousand dollars for a set of race tyres so uh, I think I'll be on my push bike on the car. <laughs> Greg I guess it's a fair contrast around here on four wheels by comparison to two. It, uh, I was only talking to another guy about that this morning. The, uh, the lap times that these superbikes are doing now is exactly the same as the lap times that we were doing six and seven years ago on our Grand Prix bikes. So uh, the motorcycles have certainly come a long way in the last few years. I think it's mainly due to the, to the uh, entire tyre technology. I'll let you get through here. Uh, and which do you prefer with the benefit of hindsight having been a leading touring car driver or still a leading touring car driver and a Grand Prix motorcycle rider? When you get to 30 years old, the more wheels that you get underneath you, the better you are. <laughs> if you keep going, you'll be able to drive the transporter next year. No, I haven't got a license and I'm not going to get one. <laughs> All right, Greg, thanks for that uh, brief chat. We'll let you get back to your concentration on the race. OK, thanks, Mike. Look out, you bloody... <laughs> cool. Oh, he's a busy man as he rounds up David Radcliffe. We will leave him there. Thank you very much, Greg Hansford. Dick Johnson in consultation with wife Jill there about uh, Greg's position on the road. Incidentally, Jim Richards has made a stop in car number one. And I'm now just having a look around the circuit to check and make sure that I think that George Fury may be back in the race lead in car number 30. We'll confirm that for you uh, shortly because that's all happened in the last uh, lap of the race while we were talking to uh, Greg Hansford.
It's thing certainly going well for George Fury and for Jimmy Richards. And the pit stops uh, have been excellent for most teams this afternoon. They have. The All the crews seem to have been pretty well drilled. And I, I think the only guy that uh, had a slightly slowish stop was, was Murray. And obviously there can always be problems in pit stops. or certainly wasn't uh, running his crew down. One of the incidents that happened a little earlier on today while we were talking to Greg Hansford was in another Mustang, but one from New Zealand this time. It's one of the Pine Pack Mustangs. Let's take a look at that replay down the bottom where Akihiko Nakaya went off before. I think it's the 32 entry, which is one of the Anderson brothers in the Mustang. And that's Bruce disappearing at a great rate of knots. Doesn't appear as though he's done any damage. Oh, who else is in there? Number 39 by the look of it, that's one of the other little Toyota Sprinters, Greg Whitaker. So two cars involved in that, there may have been a bit of oil on the track. There's Jim Richards in car one, he's made his stop and he didn't expect to do so. So obviously with uh, the sun out now at Service Paradise, they are carving up tyres a little earlier and he's having to push a much quicker race pace than he originally thought and chewing up rubber. So they will have also taken uh, an opportunity there to top up with some fuel. Okay, in the BP plus 300, let's take a look at the top three. And George Fury leads from Jim Richards. And in third placing is Queensland's Dickie Johnson. Back so at Surface back. Paradise. So and welcome Brett. back to Surface International Raceway. Sorry, Neil. Uh, I've just checked with the official lap scorers. And at this stage, after lap 55, as we look at the Graham Bailey Chickadee Commodore, it's George Fury has regained the lead from Gentleman Jim Richards in the BMW, then follows Greg Hansford in the Mustang, and Graham Crosby in car six, the Commodore. All four cars on the same lap are now moving in towards lap 57, so they're well and truly eating away into this 85 lap race once again. Then we look at Graham Bailey in the Chickadee Commodore. Yes, we haven't seen too much of uh, Graham. He made a good start in this field uh, in the uh, Chickadee Commodore. The privateer who's done a, a great job. I was very impressed with his performance uh, the last round of the Australian Touring Car Championship at, uh, at Oran Park back in, uh, in July. Intends running all the endurance races. Still running around about uh, ninth or 10th uh, on the track at the moment. And of course, uh, Graham has some exciting news because He's been able to coax uh, Alan Grice to return from Europe, where he's been contesting the European Touring Car Championship, to take over the lead role in his number two Commodore for the uh, James Hardy 1000. And uh, Graham's pretty pleased about the whole situation. In Bathurst, you've got a, two good drivers in a really top car. Now, there's no point in selling off the seat if the co-driver's going to be seconds a lap slower than you. Preferably, he's going to be as quick or quicker than you, so to get the results, you must have a quick driver. And in Alan Grice, as we know, he's a very quick driver. And during our sojourn in Europe earlier in the year, he taught me a lot, and we got along quite well. So we figure we'll get the results, with two of us going flat out. Graham Bailey, wise words, and Les Small, of course, doing all the engine work for uh, the car for Batter, so they'll have a, an absolute screamer of a motor. And he's very, very keen indeed as Alan Grice to take pole position for uh, this year's James Hardy 1000. Should be a crackerjack marathon there. Here's Peter McLeod in the auto part Commodore. And uh, Peter's been into the, into the uh, pits. However, he's back out and circulating again. Has uh, strong sponsorship. A privateer who felt the pinch uh, late last season and uh, particularly early in this season. But now he's got the backing of auto part and intends doing as much racing as he possibly can. He's teaming up this weekend with New Zealand's Glenn Clark as he did for first round of the championship at Amory Park. Remember, they had some problems there. Blew a head gasket on lap one and he led the field up to the top of the hill early on, but couldn't go on with the job. And they've had some worries this weekend too. On Thursday, they had a harmonic balancer fly off the car and they broke an oil cooler. And then on Friday, they had non-stop clutch hassles. So the car only knocked up about 30 laps prior to this race, which is not a good way to approach an endurance event. And then they had their two practice sessions yesterday and Glenn only managed to uh, squeeze about eight laps in the car on Thursday and six on Saturday. So wisely, Peter McLeod has stayed in the car at the moment, although he's working pretty hard, as you can see, and probably feeling the physical pinch just a little. And it's also, or would have also been the first drive at Service Paradise for Glenn Clark. So McLeod at the moment getting around pretty comfortably. And as always, 
a consistent driver, has been noted in the past as being very good in endurance racing. He loves endurance racing. Yeah. In fact, uh, has steered clear in recent years of the sprint racing. That's pretty high-tech uh, engine-busting uh, uh, dollars. And, of course, uh, Peter McLeod, a very interesting man. He's been around for quite a number of years and has uh, a strong success rate. Let's take a look at him. 38 years of age, comes from Wollongong on the south coast. A uh, car written off at 250Ks here at Surfers in 81. He lists as one of his career lowlights. Winner of the 83 Endurance Championships, third in the Touring Car title for 84. And, of course, drove in the 85 Daytona 24-hour Classic with Alan Moffat. Uh, didn't finish that race. That was a big disappointment to the team. But... Uh, He's one of the uh, ever presence in uh, touring car racing. Good to see him back here for the support of Auto Part and doing well today here at uh, Surface Paradise in the BP Plus 300. Interesting, Mike. He was uh, a late starter in motor racing. Uh, we notice his age there is 38, but he didn't really start to drive quick till he was about 32. And in 81, when he had that memorable crash here at Surface Paradise at the 250Ks, he, uh, in fact, in fact, won Australia's most promising young driver for that year, which was possibly a little misnomer in itself because he was 32 or 33 at that stage of his career. Tell you and what, has always been one of the Mr. Consistencies around the Australian circuit. Tell you what, the way the costs are going with uh, motorsport and everyone pulling their belt in, it might be a case shortly of uh, most of them starting racing at 32 because they won't be able to afford it until then anyway. Well, rena well renowned, of course, for his efforts in the Slick 50 Mazda and uh, some great clashes with Dick Johnson in years gone by. He's doing a good job out there, uh, single-handed around uh, here today. Georgie uh, uh, Fury in car number 30, continuing to lead the race from Gentleman Jim Richards in the JPS BMW, and Greggy Hansford up to third, Graham Crosby into fourth. Well, at present, McLeod is back in ninth position in the race, so still in the top ten, which is important, getting some points towards the Endurance Championship. He's behind, in fact, Bruce Anderson in car number 32. Alf Grant, John Prince, car 27 going through on the inside. And we've had a glimpse there of the Chickadee car as well, car number 2, Graham Bailey. He's in 10th placing. It's a good uh, Queensland combo for the James Hardy 1000. Johnny French, Alf Grant driving the uh, Dulux auto colour entry. 40 and years of racing between them. And good to see Dulux uh, getting involved with their new auto colour to ensure um, you know that they're going to be around to do racing and it's a whole thing that was instituted from here in Queensland and Dulux in New South Wales and Victoria are also backing it under auto colour and it'll be great to see uh, um, French and, uh, and Grant at uh, the James Hardy with a car that should certainly go the distance. The age-old question asking him uh, whether he's getting too old for this sort of taper. He said, no, I'm still enjoying it as much as I uh, as I used to, and as long as Alfie's still got the money, I'll still be safe. Yeah. Well, at the moment, he's being monstered by Jim Richards, who's second. So the order after 60 laps is George Fury leading. Jim Richards is in second place in car number one. The Dick Johnson, Greg Hansford combination is in third. Graham Crosby, Wayne Wilkinson in fourth position in car six. And then the comeback of the race, Alan Moffat and Peter Brock, although they have made two pit stops. And then in sixth placing out outright is Trevor Ashbury in car number 19, the ex Ken Matthews car. So that's the order at the moment, the top six. Let's have a look at the Castrol scoreboard just to confirm them. And the leader at the moment is George Fury in the skyline. From Jim Richards in the BMW. And third place is Dick Johnson and Greg Hansford in the Mustang. BP Plus 300 continues at Surfers Paradise International Raceway and true to the script, Colin Bond and the Ignis Fridges Alfa Romeo GTV6 number 75 and Tony Longhurst are back there still fighting uh, in the middle of the pack. Colin Bond who qualified yesterday in 13th position for today's race has been making uh, steady progress in the field and of course uh, as a couple of the other teams find that they might have to do a late pit stop. You can expect Bondi to be up there, I would suspect, certainly in the top six. Well, they've had to make a couple of stops that I've taken note of so far, so it's dropped them down in the standings just a little bit. Uh, Colin Bond had some problems in practice yesterday. Had uh, a torsion bar, of all things, break in the first session of practice, and it came in with the nose drooping pretty severely. Uh, they welded that up for the second session of practice and obviously uh, not wanting to push the car too hard whilst it wasn't in absolute tip-top trim. Colin was comfortable with his 13th qualifying position and then um, they flew up a new torsion bar from Sydney last evening and 
they put it in the car this morning. The man that was set to uh, drive this car today with Colin, if uh, he was required, was Lucio Cesario, who's returned from campaigning in the World Endurance Championship with the Lancia team. And that could be a very strong combination come the Castrol 500 and the James Hardy 1000. But Colin Bond, he's been around in racing for a long time. 44 years of age from Sydney, Hunters Hill specifically, driving the Alpha, of course, first won the James Hardy in 69. Three-time Australian Rally Champion, winner of the Australian Touring Car Championship, and a fine third placing in the opening round of this series this year at Amaru Park. Had a great dust-up with Tony Longhurst, and he and Tony have also had some memorable battles this year in the Better Brakes Amscar Touring Car Series at Sydney's Amaru Park. And the little V6 Alpha just soldiers on, race in, race out. And of course, they are expecting to take delivery of their new Alpha 75 for the James Hardy 1000, which they hope, of course, will put them into outright contention. Enrico Zanarini, Colin Bond and the team looking forward to that with great anticipation. They may still run this car as a number two car at Bathurst, provided the new 75 car comes in and functions well. Meanwhile, race leader George Fury still doing things very nicely at the moment, up at the right-hander at Kelly Springfield. So far they've had no problems with the Skyline today. Of course they had a turbo seal break in the 15 car in the first round of this championship at uh, Amaru Park. Things are looking pretty good for the friendly farmer from the James Hardy 1000 at Bathurst in October. After performing so strongly in the Australian Touring Car Championship. As uh, George mentioned a little earlier during our interview, they didn't set out to win the championship. They the brand new car they expected it to be a season of learning not too many things went wrong with the Peter Jackson this and Skyline they stole more pole positions than any other driver they had more wins but then lost out because of the unique scoring system with the Australian touring car title to uh, Kiwi Robbie Francovic but things looking good heading to Bathurst and George Fury in car number 30 continues to lead we'll check out the BP 300 on the Castrol scoreboard Fury leads Richards is in second and Greg Hans for third in the Dickie Johnson Mustang BP Plus 300 Classic continues at surface and the Mobile 05 Commodore is of course Peter Brock as Neil mentioned earlier and had the comeback drive of the race so far back through the field George Fury still leading uh, in the race at this stage 25 seconds clear of Jim Richards and the JPS number one BMW then of course uh, further back to number 17 Greg Hansford at the wheel of Dick Johnson's uh, Motocraft Mustang then one lap down behind them, we have Tony Longhurst, who is running in fourth place in the BMW 325. Just clear of uh, Peter Brock in 05, one lap down. Then two laps down, number 27, French and Grant in the Commodore. And then right behind them, car number four, Peter McLeod in uh, the uh, auto part entry. So at this stage, 05, with um, Peter Brock at the wheel. Fifth on the road. That's not too bad considering their pit stops now. Yeah, very good job. And uh, remember that Brock had to sneak another stop in along the way as well while we were talking with Greg Hansford earlier on. The car still sounding pretty sweet. Just while you were going through that update, Mike, uh, John French has also come to the pits in car number 27. Well, that will move McLeod up one. It's all hypothetical at this stage with the laps down, but certainly there's no doubt about the, uh, the top four. And we could be heading for a decent dice here shortly as uh, Johnson's car... Uh, with Greg Hansford aboard at the moment uh, moves up closer to Peter Brock in the 05 Commodore over the back of the circuit at the stage One guy who must be feeling uh, reasonably pleased with uh, his co-driver's outing today in the Mustang is Dickie Johnson He's down in the pit road with Colin Young Well Dick, uh, you weren't feeling too well early in the race and you handed over to Greg and he's doing a fine job And he's doing a good job That's why we chose him So uh, what about yourself? Are you feeling okay? Mate, once I get rid of this wog, which is the first one I've had in eight years, I suppose uh, I'll be back to brand new again. Well, Dick, we've seen uh, Peter Brock's uh, Commodore have a lot of tyre troubles today. How's the Mustang, and will Greg go right through to the end of the race? Well, hopefully it should go through to the end of the race. Uh, he's running a little bit slower than what, what I ran in the early stages of the race, which should look after the tyres a bit better than uh, what I did in the early part of the race, because... I suppose it all depends on the first bit of the race as to how the rest of the race goes. That's, that's why I like to sort of get out there and have a bit of a go 
and uh, but it does sort of play a bit of a hard time on the tyre sometimes. Dick, it hasn't been a great year for the Mustang, but into the Endurance Series now, the car is looking strong. It's about the right time of the year to start coming good, I think. Yeah, looking forward to the mountain in October? Well, hopefully. You know, we've still got a little bit to go. We've found an area uh, in the engine that is giving us a little bit more horsepower, which is making a difference today. And I, I should keep working on that area until Bathurst comes. OK, Dick Johnson in the pits, Greg Hansford in the uh, Mustang out on the track in third place. Let's go back to Mike Raymond. Thank you very much, Cole Young, talking there with uh, Dickie Johnson. We're following Greg Hansford in car number 17, as we've mentioned to you. Greg's doing a fine job running in third on the road, his first uh, run with uh, Dick Johnson. And let's recap them on the Castrol scoreboards. Georgie Fury is your race leader. He's 25 seconds clear of Jimmy Richards and Greg Hansford in Dickie Johnson's Mustang. watching the BP Plus 300 from Surface Paradise International Raceway and that is our race leader George Fury in the Nissan Skyline and doing it well way out in front of Jim Richards in the BMW and the only other car on the same lap is Greg Hansford in the Dick Johnson Mustang Graham Crosby the uh, Crosby Commodore has also snuck in they're on lap 72 at the moment so they lead Murray Carter, the Brock Moffat combination, Tony Longhurst and Colin Bond are all uh, at, at least a lap down on our front runners at the moment, Fury, Richards and Hansford. One man would be saying golly about the way that George Fury's running at the front of the field has to be Freddie Gibson and Colin Young is with him in the pits. Certainly, Mike, one happy man in the pit area is Fred Gibson, team manager for the Nissan team. Pretty uh, George is out in front and uh, appears to be doing it well with about nine laps to go. There he is, Cole. He's doing it fairly easy. I think we've done our homework the day in the car since he's running OK. But there's still nine laps to go, and I never count until they're over, Cole. Well, uh, earlier in the race, George just lost the lead uh, very briefly when uh, he made a pit stop and then uh, he got back in front of Jim Richards. Uh, things going according to plan? Yeah, well, the thing is, we, we were leading. We had a tussle with Alan Moffat, who was a lap behind, which is a bit annoying. Slowed us fairly well and closed the gap up again. Apparently, George wasn't too happy about that. No, he wasn't impressed, and I don't blame him either. I think it was bad news. But the thing is, like, uh, so Jimmy closed the gap a fair bit before the pit stop. But the thing is, then we pit stop it and then send, say, uh, Jimmy come in and did his pit stop, so we went back to the lead again. So at present, we're 29 seconds in front of Jimmy. Well, now that uh, George is throwing off Alan Moffat and Peter Brock, is he happier? Oh, I think he's happy, but I think, as I said before, and I've stated before, I think the Commodore's in a fair bit of trouble in long-distance racing, especially at places like Service Paradise. Bathurst is another kettle of fish. It's easy on tyres. He is hard on tyres. We've solved our tyre problem thanks to Dunlop's heavy work out the last couple of weeks in Tamaru. And uh, I think we should get the job done today, OK, Cole? So early in the race, do you think uh, Moffat should have moved over and let George uh, go? Might, most definitely. But you know Alan Moffat. <laughs> OK, uh, Freddie Gibson uh, here in the pit area and uh, done a great job looking after the uh, Nissan team effort. George Fury leads the BP 300. You're not wrong, Cole. With about nine laps uh, to go, as Freddie Gibson mentioned. In fact, nine as they go across the strike now. And the friendly farmer, the lead foot from Tal Malmo in New South Wales, doing one heck of a job. 29 seconds to break over Jimmy Richards and the JPS number one BMW. Then back to Greg Hansford in third, Graham Crosby in fourth place, Murray Carter, the super vet back there in fifth, Peter Brock and Alan Moffat sixth overall, Longhurst is the next in the queue, and then of course Colin Bond in the Ignis uh, Fridges Alpha. Ashby, the next one back behind them, French, and then uh, Graham Bailey. So things aren't uh, going too badly for Graham. He's still in there at 11th spot at the front of the uh, pack. is this man, a fellow who's looking pretty good for uh, what he hopes to be a record blistering lap at the uh, Hardy 1000 at uh, Mount Panorama Bathurst the first weekend in October. Would love to beat the record that he set in the turbocharged uh, Nissan Bluebird a few years ago. And he believes that this Group A Skyline is just the uh, power packet to uh, be able to do it. We'll certainly look forward to that, particularly with the likes of Gerhard Berger and Roberto Ravaglia coming with a full house factory Schnitzer BMW. Mercedes coming under Bob Jane. Looks like being a crackerjack field. And now Fury going past Graham Bailey, who on lap 70, our last uh, official count, was in 11th position. Blue flag being waved. So basically the situation sees Jim Richards about half to three quarters of a lap behind George Fury and therefore not in a position to really challenge. Just a question as to uh, whether or not 
Fury's going to make any mistakes, and I frankly doubt that. It appears as though the Nissan team have done their homework. The tough thing for the drivers at the moment is this glaring sunlight, but then behind that are the blackest clouds of all time. It is uh, really looking dark and dim on the horizon at the moment towards the west, so they might just scrape through this race by the skin of their teeth. Of course, pressure for the uh, Peter Jackson this team would have been eased uh, around the pit area, I suppose, by uh, the unfortunate loss of Gary Scott right at the starting grid. They're having only one car to look after. They uh, did a great stop, got out very quickly, and have now been able to extend that lead, as we said, to 29.30 seconds. And that's basically sealed the race for them, hasn't it? Well, you're right there. The safety, the safety buffer, of course, uh, would have been the second car running second in the race. But I tell you, who is still in there and running after making the front row was Graham Crosby in the Bob Jane T Mart's Commodore. He's he, actually uh, done a fine job uh, on our last official lap count. Lap 76, he was one lap down on the leaders in fourth position as Lester Smurden exits the pits in the yellow car. It was Cros. He's ahead of Peter Brock. And behind Peter Brock, Tony Longhurst. So just having a look at the top six, just to confirm those again, we've got Fury leading from Richards, from the Greek hands for Dick Johnson, Mustang, Graham Crosby in fourth. And then Brock behind. Okay, taking a look at the Castrol scoreboard, and Farmer George leads the field from Jimmy Richards, and behind in third place, Greg Hansford. And welcome back to the BP 300 Classic from Sinister Black Clouded Service Paradise International Raceway. Here's our race leader, George Fury in the Nissan Skyline, moving up behind Greg Hansford, Hansford's car, of course carrying our Sevens exclusive race cam unit and uh, George Fury just ready to put one lap on the third place driver in the field. Greg running third at the moment, Jimmy Richards in second spot, and uh, the man we're following with race cam at the rear window is of course the VP Classic leader, Georgie Fury in the Peter Jackson Skyline. And he's been sitting in behind uh, Greg now for about a lap and a half, should make his move as they come down the front straight here. Here he comes down the inside. And how easy, and a wave back to Greg to say thanks for moving over. He gives George the, the clear line for the corner. And George Fury, unimpeded, goes on to lead this race uh, with only maybe uh, five or six laps still to run. So I've just done a score update as of lap 80. Fury from Richards. And those two drivers are now well clear of the third place driver, Greg Hansford. And then in fourth place is Graham Crosby. But at the wheel of that car is Wayne Wilkinson from New Zealand. And there he is. Good performance from him started racing back in about 1972 and has cleaned up the Benson Hedges 1000 event over there three years 74 78 and 82 and finished second three times as well so he's no fool, fool at the wheel of a touring car he also uh, won the Nissan Sports Series in 1985 with uh, Neville Crichton and in the very first Wellington Street race in 19 what was that 85 when Robbie Francovic cleaned them up he uh, finished third um, with Nev Crichton again so it's a good effort from him well, the man in front of him in car number two is no spring chicken. That, of course, <laughs> is Graham Bailey. And he's done very well here today as well. Ninth on the road. And the car we mentioned before that will be uh, co-driven by Alan Grice for the James Hardy 1000. But I would think uh, a great outing for Cros. Here's Glenn. Peter McLeod's entry. Glenn Clark at the wheel of the car. It's been circulating and doing about four minute lap times. I think it's on about three or four cylinders, so it's very sick. Glenn's been involved in Australian motor racing for a while, and this is not the way that he wants to do it, I'm sure, but they are sorting that car out. So Wilkinson finds himself with a problem at the moment, and that's how to deal with the Graham Bailey Commodore, but he closes nicely under brakes. Well, he dealt with that pretty sweetly. After all that, at last count, Bailey was back in around about 11th position, so he's obviously got a problem with his car. Wilkinson, who you may recall from last year, who teamed up with Graham Bouquet in car 39, the Sleepyhead Commodore entry, gets to visit Australia again for this race, the Castrol 500 at Sandown and the James Hardy 1000 coming up in early October. They've made a mark on Australian touring car racing these Kiwis, what with uh, Robbie Francovic winning the touring car title this year, expatriate Kiwi, Jimmy Richards taking it last year, Graham Crosby arriving on the scene, and looking good in the endurance races. The other thing, of course, that's very interesting is just the massive injection of, of cash, the cash that Bob Jane has thrown into the sport once more 
and I think he's tipped it into the right area here because Graham Crosby qualified the Commodore on the front row shared exactly the same time as George Fury at 115.2 and the last lap board is now out so Georgie Fury in car number 30 continues to lead the BP Plus 300 Classic and let me tell you he's just going to get home in the nick of time because these black clouds are just all over the circuit and just as George heads off towards the fast left hander at the back straight Jim Richards comes past our commentary point that is exactly half a lap between the two lead cars and then remember they have one lap on the Greek Hansford Dick Johnson Ford Mustang so a very good performance from the Nissan Skyline team this afternoon and I think that uh, Fred Gibson and the entire team Andy and all the boys have done a fine job to uh, sort out this turbo and make it race reliable for a very long and hard race what is good to see uh, with sponsorship of races and with so many oil companies involved with Mobil obviously and Valvoline and uh, today's sponsor BP uh, the race winner is going to carry the winner's product because Georgie Fury is coming out of the last corner down the long straight here at Surface Paradise International Raceway and the BP plus 300 goes to the friendly farmer Georgie Fury in car number 30. Second spot across the line will be Jimmy Richards in the JPS BMW and a fighting Third place will go to Greg Hansford of Queensland in the Dick Johnson Mustang. Fourth goes to Kiwi Graham Crosby in the Bob Jane t marts Commodore. And fifth to the combination of Peter Brock and Alan Moffat in the Mobile Commodore. Just recapping them for you on our scoreboard. Fury wins round two. Richards takes a second. And Dick Johnson's Mustang places third. And welcome back to the finish of the BP 300 Classic from Surface Paradise International Raceway. Georgie Fury in car number 30, the Peter Jackson Nissan Skyline, certainly carrying the winner's uh, uh, product, the logos, BP. Has got up to win round two here today and looks certainly a very strong chance for the James Hardy 1000 at Mount Panorama at Bathurst. Second spot, as we mentioned to you, has gone to the lead driver for the JPS BMW team, gentleman Jim Richards and a great third place going to Greg Hansford in Dick Johnson's Mustang. Let's go down to Victory Lane and a Paddy Welsh. Thanks, Mike. Well, as you can see, it's very crowded down here with me. A very happy George Fury and a very happy Tony Brooks from the general manager of BP Australia. I'm certain he wants to pass his congratulations well, on to George. Nice to see you in the Thank first BP 300. Nice Thank you. Nice to see you running on our field as well. Yep. Well, we flew on BP. And we, flew, we flew up here on Australian Airlines, so we did pretty good actually, but uh, I, I enjoyed the race, it, it was really good and uh, uh, Graham Crosby sort of pushed us along for a while, but, uh, and for a while we were worried that Jimmy Richards wasn't going to stop, you know, that would have been a possibility, but uh, of course stop he did and after that we could take it reasonably easy. Disappointment losing uh, Gary Scott so early, well right at the start. Well I, I still don't know what's happened to him but of course I see the car parked there and uh, I guess he uh, may have broken an axle or something like that. Broken drive shaft and you had, you had a great dice with uh, with Alan Moffat out there for a while. Yeah, yeah, I, the, the one time I got beside him and I had the wrong gear so I couldn't pull away, you know, I, I put it in uh, top gear instead of third so uh, then a couple of laps later I passed him but it was good I enjoyed it and uh, I was just a bit worried that um, Graham Cosby, Cosby was going to catch up so I got a bit desperate towards the end. So everything looking good for the rest of the season now particularly the James Hardy 1000? Oh, I think this proves that our Peter Jackson Nissans are, are reliable and they are long distance cars and uh, after 40 laps I was still able to do very quick times on, on old tyres so I think it's looking good for James Hardy. Great. Congratulations to George Fury, Thank winner this much. afternoon of the BP 300. I think we're going to get a chat with uh, Jimmy Richards just quickly. Jim, congratulations. Tough drive. It was a muddling sort of race. It looked like rain and then we had brilliant sunshine. But nevertheless, it was uh, good racing out there. No, it was. It was great. Uh, we got sort of muscled off the circuit on the first lap, which dropped us down to about 20th place. Um, I think if we had have been able to keep in touch with the leaders in the early stages, uh, perhaps we would have been a lot closer and maybe the result would have been different but congratulations to George, it was a great race and we're very happy to be second. Was it planned that you were hoping to go through the race without a stop? No, it was never planned to do that, we couldn't have gone through without a stop but we wanted to do as much as we could on the old tyres and then come in for a stop with new tyres and then race hard for the remainder of the race. First and a second left you very well placed in the Endurance Championship now, hasn't it? I think so, yes, yes, so we're looking pretty good for the Championship. Okay Jim, thank you very much, we get a quick chat with our third place getters, Dickie Johnson 
How's the flu, firstly? Mate, I'm sort of not bad now, and uh, it's easy when it's all hot and sweaty. You've got something to smile about? <laughs> yeah, it's about time, isn't it? It's a long time and since the car's gone so well, and I think it's sort of coming on to form at exactly the right time, and, and Greg did a fantastic job. Great to boot. Great to boot on the Mustang. Terrific, yeah, you're looking yeah, a little hot and bothered. Yeah, so it should be. It's bloody hot in there, but uh, no, terrific. Nothing went wrong, so uh, we finished in a good spot. But it's looking good for you two, leading up to the big ones? I hope so. Too right, mate, I tell you, it should surprise a few people, maybe. Best of luck, OK? That's uh, Dick Johnson and Greg Hansford third today in the BP 300. We'll take a break and be back with Mike Raymond at Surface Paradise International Raceway. The James Hardy 1000 is but five weeks away, and many of the leading teams and privateers are already moving their Mount Panorama programs into high gear. Uh, for one or two individuals, they face a bleak bathos. That's unless the green light is given to sponsorship proposals at boardroom level. Motor racing, more than any other sport, is about dollars and cents. Development programs absorb hundreds of man-hours and tens of thousands of dollars. And without sponsorship, you're going nowhere in this business. I only hope that you, my fans, can, can take the introduction of Group A and work with it. I want to see Holden's win. And I want to see Ford's win. But Jaguar did it this time, and I'm very, very grateful that they gave me the opportunity. Working with the new Group A touring car category was exactly what former Australian Grand Prix winner and Bathurst victor John Goss did at Mount Panorama last year. In 1984, the Tassie-born speedster invited Scottish ace Tom Walkingshaw to share his white XJS Jaguar in the 1000K Enduro. It's history now, the car never got off the line, triggering off this spectacular shunt, which stopped the race less than 30 seconds after the start. However, Walkingshaw knew the potential of the cat's claws for 1985. He entered a three-car team and flew Goss and Aussie compatriot Ron Dixon to England for a private test session at Donington Park before the Jags were freighted to Australia. It was a dream come true for Goss. He could forget the privateer hassles and concentrate on a full factory drive, knowing he'd been chosen on wheel ability alone. You get used to this lot, they're a bloody nuisance all over Europe. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's true. We got them at home. Every too, time you're picking your nose or scratching your bum, they're looking yeah, they, at yeah, you. That's right, yeah. just, there's just no fun left in life. Mm. By the time the walking shore crew arrived at Bathurst, Gossie was prime. The overseas stars might have been commanding the headlines, but he was ready to do his talking where and when it counted most. They're racing and Walkingshaw gets a blind of it, so too does Johnson and Johnson will split them and so does Grice. Taking on the Jaguar as Walkingshaw made a blind of it, Alan missed the start completely. Here comes the scrap again and just look at this for a sandwich. One out and one back for Robbie Francevic as he ends up behind John Goss now. Alan Grice takes some advantage. Goss on the outside wants to argue. The two of them will go side by side to the cutting. I don't think Grice will give way. No, but John Goss is now getting into the car. We can see just how delicately the seat has been strapped into the vehicle. There are rather enormous cable ties that are stringing the seat to the roll bar. Four new slick tyres have been fitted. These are the special Denlock Dunlop slick tyres, which when flat can be run on a racing circuit. The car has been fired up once again. And Gossie leaves the pits in a time, I should think, of around about 40 to 45 seconds. Well, Gossie knows the feeling. He's been there before, and it must be an incredible feeling to know that you've driven so far. Well, actually, Mike, he hasn't been in the car at the finish line in 74. He was watching Kevin Bartlett bring it through the rain. This is his first genuine behind the wheel taking the checkered flag, and it'll be a highlight of his career, one thing he'll I never bet, forget. I bet they could take the seat out and he'd drive it from the glove box for the last half lap. Yes, he will. Coming down through the dipper at uh, Nissan, and all giving John Goss a marvellous reception as he pokes the number 10 car down to the exit of Valvoline Corner and this the final lap of the 85 James Hardy 1000 the pressure is now off his shoulders although he might be loose in the seat well here he comes, Johnny Goss in car number 10, the JRA Jaguar just wanting to make sure that all goes well for the final quarter 
Well, we say another two Ks to the end of uh, Conrod Strait, and look what he's waiting for. Would you believe uh, this? The man who instituted is the one pro? two. Is he a pro? Johnny Goss is going to engineer the one two. JRA Jaguar finish to Australia's great race. Chalk up one. John Goss, the winner of the James Hardy Classic for 1985. So a Jag 1-3. Everyone was convinced the Jags would be back for another lick at Bathurst in October. But only a week ago, Tom Walkingshaw indicated he wouldn't be returning with a full complement of cars. It's a disappointment because uh, I'm a competitor, I suppose, first. I'm a businessman. Tom's a businessman and uh, he's obviously had some difficulty in uh, getting uh, together those uh, aspects of his effort that are required to get the cars down here to Australia. A damn shame, I think, for a lot of followers of... Uh, the cats on the mountain. I'm disappointed but um, I'd like to be there one way or the other and uh, I've just got to make sure that I plan that properly so that we uh, can do a, a job that's uh, fitting I suppose. We have a car here as you can see. I think I know what's required at Bathurst. If we could get the right package together and introduce the right management we'd be very pleased to be there. I enjoy the association I've got with Jaguar but I'd want to be able to do it right, Mike. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a team manager, extra personnel to go there first class. Mm. If you go there first class with the car that you have sitting here, is there a possibility that John Goss can win as a privateer at Bathurst? There's, there's always a chance to win, and it's an, a very uh, unique race in that the local knowledge factor at Bathurst is a very important component to winning. But really there's only one class at Bathurst and that is first class when you refer to the organisation and support that the team must have. That costs money and it takes time to put in place and I repeat again if we go to Bathurst at all we'd be wanting to do it properly. So with one XJS Jaguar already on the drawing board for 1987 and one complete white unit here for 1986 John Goss obviously plans to be at Mount Panorama. Let's face it, the James Hardy 1000 wouldn't be the same without him. Welcome back to our telecast of the action from Surface Paradise International Raceway. You know, this is a rather familiar car with a familiar number, the 05 Peter Brockmobile. Of course, has been seen during the Australian Touring Car Championship and also selected rounds of the European Championship this year. And more recently at Spa, when a few Kiwis and a few Aussies got together to take the King's Cup. Europe can boast numerous postcard settings for its major racing circuits, but none more impressive than Belgium's Spa Francochamps course. Located 120 kilometres southeast of Brussels in the Ardennes Forest, Spa is the traditional home of the Belgian Formula One Grand Prix and touring car racing's most arduous contest, the 24-hour day-night enduro. The circuit once measured over 14 kilometres, but was changed back in 83 to this shortened layout of 6.94 k's, which still combines the high-speed straights, sweeping turns and hairpin corners, qualifying as one of the world's most challenging circuits. The 24 hours of Spa is the manufacturer's blue ribbon race. It's also round eight of the European Touring Car Championship, a title which began back at Monza, Italy in March and marked the arrival in Europe of the Australian Commodore. 
Local stars Peter Brock, Alan Moffat, Alan Grice and Graham Bailey were the flavours of the month. Grice led the opener before encountering problems and at chequered flag time the old firm of Tom Walkingshaw and Wynne Percy were in victory lane. Round two was in the snow and sleet at Donington Park, England. The Commodores were back, Grice in his underfunded white V8 and Brock in the mobile Holden dealer team entry. Both led the event before trouble set in. Yet again, the Rovers Drovers, Walkingshaw and Percy showed the field no mercy. Round three was at Hockenheim, Germany, where the Volvos were keen to stage a fight back. So too was Alan Grice, who charged to the front and resisted every passing attempt until taken out of the field of play by an errant golf. The Volvos, however, hung in there to score their first blue chip points in the series. Round four took the teams back to Italy in Masano, where Formula One ace Gerhard Berger gave BMW its first major win of the tournament. The closest finish of the championship came in round five at Anderstorp in Sweden. Lindstrom and Granberg appeared to have it all sewn up, but Armin Hanna in the Bastos Rover came from the clouds to push the Volvos all the way to the flag. Round six was behind the Iron Curtain at Bruno in Czechoslovakia, where the Ford Sierra set the early pace. At the finish, though, it was Lindstrom first again for Volvo. The seventh race of the series was at Zeltwig in Austria. The Volvos and Rovers topped the qualifying and dictated the early pace. But Siggy Muller in the Ford Sierra Turbo tasted victory after the Swedemobile produced a hiccup at post-race scrutineering. The eighth round was at the Nürburgring in Germany, and Roberto Revalia sprung another BMW surprise. After eight rounds, the score sheet shows three wins to Volvo, two by Rover and BMW, and a single victory to Ford's Turbo Sierra. Cars moving in now for the start of the Spa 24-hour classic from Spa Frankelschaft in Belgium. And it'll be Tom Walkingshaw in car number eight and Piro in the BMW to split the front row. There's the tail of the field coming through and the lights turn to green. Walkingshaw on the inside of the Bastos Rover. Piro moving to the outside and Granberg making a good start as well. Here's Piro moving down and a touch of guards here as they head into a roost for the first time. It'll be Walkingshaw's corner. He'll lead the BMW. Moving up very quickly behind them. Granberg, Olufsen in the second of the Volvos and they swing along towards the straight. Piro sitting right in behind Tom Walkingshaw at this stage and Armin Hanna making a great start is up to third. Along the long straight there and up towards Lake Cone as we switch now to the helicopter shot looking down over the Ardennes forest and now into the in-car camera with Alf Granberg. Granberg losing a spot there to uh, the BMW made a brilliant start, was up to third at one stage, there's the rest of the field coming through, Neil Lowe in car number six, the second of the mobile Commodores, a good start but starting out of about position 23. Down away from Rivage and through Tour, Walkinshaw leads with Harner in the second Bastos Rover there in second place, Piro in third, and Alan Grice now looks to have moved up the field to fourth place. Yes indeed, a great start from Alan Grice, doing very very well indeed. There's Granberg in car number two, sitting right in behind him, Giudone and the Ford Turbo Sierra, and also Soper making a good move here on the inside. Just look at the traffic congestion, but the Rovers at this stage are running away from it. There's Grice up to fourth. Then car number four coming through very quickly, that's Giudone, and his teammate of course is uh, Britain Steve Soper. Ran through Stavlo and now up towards Bonchimor where they rejoin now the old circuit, the old spa circuit which used to be 14 kilometres long and was a flat out blind. They shoot along the long straight now all the way up to what is affectionately known as the bus stop chicane. Walking shorts in front, Harder in second place, Carroll in third and there in fourth place is Alan Grice. Here's the two Rovers, and Grice making a move here on Piro. Tom Walkingshaw through this part of the course, sitting right in behind Armin Hanna. Next is Piro in the BMW, Alan Grice the next one, followed by Giudone, and then Granberg moving up very quickly indeed, and Peter Brock in car number five. Up towards La Source, the hairpin here, just before the pit straight, to complete the first of many laps, 24 hours here at Spa. Exit this corner and Alan Grice sitting right on the tail here of Piro. Here's Grice, we'll see if he makes his move. Trying to find some racing room, moves to the outside of Piro now. And the Sydney Privateer as they stream down the front straight. Has he got him? Yes, he has. Grice now moves into third spot. Walking short leading, Hanna in second. Here comes Grice and Piro right behind him. 
Watch out for the Fords as well. The Ford Sierras now of Budone and Soap are the two works cars. And the non-works car there of Harold Gross also moving up. The Ford Sierras with the turbo power beginning to show here on the high-speed straights of Spa. Once again, they stream along the straight. Tom Walkingshaw in command of the situation, the fastest man here. There's Alan Grice running in third spot at the moment. BMW losing a spot as well, and Peter Brock making a good move up here on the inside and car number five, so he's making very steady progress. Yes, Brock up past Harold Gross there with that one of those Ford Sierras as the cars come down. Now through the corner of Rivage, a tight right-hand hairpin, and accelerate away, down through Pouan and up towards Stavlet. Tom Walkingshaw who has put a lot of effort and certainly a lot of sponsorship money into the exercise here this weekend. Once again, we take uh, pictures from Wolf Granberg's car as he sits in behind the BMW heading down the hill to the right-hander. Granberg on the brakes there, and as he accelerates out of here, the car pitching slightly sideways there. The car in front of him, you can see, is the BMW of Pura. Here's Giudone making a move on Alan Grice. So Grice finds himself under a little bit of pressure here. Giudone in car number four. The two Rovers streaming away, and Giudone has actually passed Grice. Now Piro moving up to put a little pressure on the Sydney privateer through a Rouge once again. There's Grice. Piro going through. Giudone, then Peter Brock moving up a spot. Yes, the Sierra is moving right up now as Walking Shaw comes up towards Lake Home for what is now the third time. 24 hours still to go. The race starts a little bit later. So it's back at 5 o'clock. Watch out behind her now. Piro coming up alongside of Dan Murray. Here comes Croft in the 05 Global Commodore. Looking for a way past, but there's no way you can try that spin on Granberg. And Brock off the bends in the Ardennes. He joins the track. Here's Tom Walkingshaw coming through. Alan Harner sitting right in behind him. But down at the next turn, they're waving the oil flags. And Harner very much sideways. Marshall standing on the edge of the track, waving the cars down at 180 k's. Goodness gracious me. Walkingshaw still continues to lead from Armin Hanna. Then Alan Grice has been slipping back through the field in fifth spot at the moment. Dieter Cuesta right behind him as they come through Eau Rouge. And Peter Brock, if anything, is gaining on them. And so too is Aussie Ron Dixon. Yeah, Dixon's Rover now starting to catch up and show the pace of the other two Rovers up ahead there. Tyler has dropped back a little bit as a result of that sideways moment earlier on and perhaps taking a while to settle himself. He almost got sideways again there on the oil as he goes away, and now look at this. Here, yeah, Brock is now right up with Grice. They've got a slow Mercedes ahead of them. Grice looks towards the inside there. And Cuesta keeping them all honest as well as they exit that corner. Here's Grice, number 27, running in fifth spot. Brocky is right behind him in the number five car as they head down through the chicane. So Brock's doing it well, and Dixon is there, but Grice is slowing. He's got a problem there, Mike. He's got a problem, and I'm not sure what it is. He's driving there by the side of the track. Well, there's something has gone wrong with Grice. Oh, Grice off the racetrack in the dirt and the dust, and it would appear he's dropped the front wheel off the car. So bad luck indeed for Alan Grice and the Roadways Commodore. Yes, the front wheel is completely missing. Obviously, he's trying to use the outside rim around the circuit to get back to the pit area, but it's a long haul back to the pits. Yes, indeed, but he's trying there to stop any more damage to the car, and Brock's into the pits as well. It's a bit early for a routine stop at this stage. Well, mechanics are unsure about this. They're ready to change the tyres. What's this? Peter Brock stepping from the car. The hood is up. And the early indications are there is a motor problem with the number five car. Bad luck indeed with Grice coming off. And then, of course, uh, Peter Brock. And here's Grice arriving right behind Brock. Front wheel missing. Grice out of the car talking to co-driver Michelle Delcourt. So the Aussies have got a lot of work to do in the pit area. Yes, they're looking underneath the car. I wonder that, whether despite Grice's efforts to keep the car on the smooth there on the, on the side of the track, whether or not that's damaged underneath the car. And we notice also that Armin Harner has gone through and taken the boss. Tom Walking Shorts Armin is looking pretty good at this stage in car number seven, the Bastos Rover. The Rovers are in front and looking good in the Spark 24 hours. Well, the Alan Grice, number 27 Commodore, being pushed back in the pit bay. They still have a lot of work to do on the car. And meantime, problems for Peter Brock's number five car, we believe, has blown a head gasket. So they have a lot of work to do. Meantime, the number six car is in their second entry with the Kiwis aboard. Graham Bowkett goes out and returns to the racetrack. And looks like a problem here for one of the Ford Sierras. 
Yes, Mike, it's blown the turbocharger and they're pushing that car away and I think they're going to retire that one. At this stage in the race, there's no way that you can spend that much time repairing the car. And in comes number seven, the lead car now. Hana gets out, Jeff Allen takes over. This is a routine pit stop. And out goes Allen, back into the race. Whether or not he can hold that lead over Walkinshaw, who's already made his pit stop, remains to be seen. There's Berger waiting for the BMW to come in. Once again, we pick them up on the front straight. And one driver who is making a great fist of the Spa 24-hour classic is this man, Ronnie Dixon of Australia in car number nine, up in the top eight and running very, very strongly indeed. And talking about Aussies, here's number 105, Sydney privateer Bob Holden in the small car class and hanging in there all the way. Down towards their route, down the start, finish straight there. You can see the, the Sierra there. Needs this car at the wheel of Sofa's car. That's the three car. And there's the number two Volvo. There's needs bits again, running well with the Sierra. It'll be interesting to see whether or not this car can finish 24 hours. It's the first 24 hour race these have ever done. And this. That looks like uh, Graham Bowquet has gone off the circuit in car number six, just tried to shorten the corner a little, but he manages to go through the chicane without dropping a spot. Whoops! 111 around sideways, and plenty of traffic coming from behind. And it's the this, I know not how. Alan Moffat sitting in the number five car. They've effected repairs to that and the car is ready to take back to the racetrack. Drops an hour and a half. They've got a lot of work to do. We're in the pits now. That's the uh, 06 car, isn't it? That's that mobile Holden the team number six car. And out goes Grice. Grice now back in the race as well as the sign for Jeff Allen to come in and Denny Holm to take over that rover. That's the seven car. In it comes. Certainly a lot of work in the pit area, as you mentioned. The Grice car has gone out in the Shildell Court at the wheel of that car. A routine stop here for the Rovers. Jeff Allen is out. Denny Holm now in behind the wheel. So New Zealand's former Grand Prix champion takes on the Spa 24-hour classic. There's Walkinshaw back out in front there. The car at the moment driven by Eddie Euston, but the Walkinshaw 8 Bastos Rover is back out in the lead. Once again, coming down towards the right-hander. Number five, Alan Moffat at the wheel of the Peter Brock Commodore. Got a lot of work to do, and as you can see, the lights are on at Spa. Yes, this is the most difficult time here. Dusk and dawn. Meantime, pit signals out to the Mobile Holden dealer team. John Harvey in car number five has stepped out of the car looking for a co-driver. But there's no Peter Brock about. Brock was scheduled to do this stint, and Harvey is anything but happy. Says, oh, to hell with it. I'll go out and drive the next stint myself. Obviously, Harvey might have come in just a little earlier. Yep, Harvey's trapped himself back in there. He's getting out again now. Brock's arrived. Brock now gets into the car, and they start the car there for Brock. And out he goes, back into the race with the 05 Mobile Dealer Team car. Coming down the straight again, and Tom Walkinshaw doing it very, very comfortably indeed in car number eight. Goodness me, as I said before, he's put his stamp on this race. The cars have run faultlessly. Siggy Muller now steps into the Eggenberger Ford Sierra, number three. The car has been running splendidly throughout the evening, and he's still in there with a big chance. Down a couple of laps on the leaders, but, and a little slow to get up the hill for the first time. But Siggy Muller is underway. And here's the man they're all talking about in Europe this season, driving car number 10, Gerhard Berger, the Formula One driver, a winner of this event last year. And boy, what a splendid season he's having, not only in Formula One, but also in the touring cars. A man in a hurry and electrifying to watch here at the Spa Francochamp course. Number seven there, that's the Hana Bastos Rover. Still running strongly there in third place. And we've got some problems here, some major problems. For, of course, the number five mobile Commodore, and would you believe it, it has blown a head gasket again. So that's two head gaskets. They're going to drop almost three hours in this race. They dropped an hour and a half on the first pit stop, and they've been in the pits now. Meantime, Peter Brock, with his chiropractor, Dr. Eric, having a little relaxing time there. And uh, it would appear at this stage that uh, Peter Brock, uh, after doing some night driving, is having a little relax, and Dr. Eric, Obviously going to put him on a staple diet. And the man leading Spa at the moment is the big bear himself, Denny Holm. Bastos Rover number seven there. Going away, he's not got a very big lead though. Gerhard Berger's in second place. And there in the pits is the man that was leading, Tom Walkinshaw with Bastos Rover number eight. Yes, they've had a wretched run of luck uh, in the last 15 minutes. Axel out of the car. Some major problems for Tom Walkinshaw and Wynne Percy. They've had axle problems uh, 
throughout the career of really of the uh, of the rover tom doesn't seem too unhappy about the whole situation but he knows now that he's not going to win spa 1986. in comes bastos rover number seven now home bringing the car in that will automatically put gerhard berger into the lead in car number 10. So a pretty sad uh, situation for the walking shore camp. Manuel Pirro in the number 10 car has taken over the lead. Rovers dropping out of the top four positions. And Pirro at this stage is in pretty good shape. Schnitzer, of course, had a 1-2 for BMW here in this 24-hour classic last year. And at this stage of the race, they're looking good for a repeat in 1986. Bill Lowe is bringing this car in now, and this is not a scheduled pit stop. It comes in very slowly, and uh, the mechanics are quick to lift the bonnet. They've obviously got a problem with it. And the problem is no oil pressure. Lowe walks disconsolately away from the car, and they're going to push it back to see what they can do about the problem, see if uh, they can fix it. But this could be a problem now for the King's Cup for them. Well, that's BMW number 10, Gerhard Berger, with Atomic written on the side of his helmet. And there's been some sort of atomic problem with that car, Mike, I think. Yes, they were looking so good. The car is in the pits now. Mechanics under the front of the car. It was suggested that... Uh, and tried to cool it earlier, they threw uh, a bucket of water over the alternator and have had problems since, but mechanics have been working on the car here for about four or five minutes. Berger steps from the car. He wouldn't be very, very happy at all about the whole situation. And here are the Commodores again. Yes, Alan Moffat in car number five and Alan Grice in number 27. They're running in pretty close company in the closing stage of this race. Keeping in mind, though, in order for Australia's to take the King's Cup, it will require the number six mobile Commodore to come back out on the racetrack. And it has diabolical problems with no oil pressure whatsoever. So Moffat sweeps through, followed by Alan Grice. Two Commodores still running, and looky here. Number six has been fired up for one and a half laps around the circuit. So maybe Neil has the real lowdown on the King's Cup at Spa in 1986. I'll tell you what, if, uh, if Neil Loker managed to just get around and park perhaps even at the top out of La Source and sit there, and here he comes now. Car number six, Neil Lowe, almost in angel gear, coming up to this tight right-hander. And we'll see if he pulls it across, because it's a downhill run here to the finish, as you can see, yes. And he's going to sit there and wait until the uh, leader goes across, takes the chequered flag, and then uh, just drop it out of gear. Moffat will look for him as they come through the turn. Knows he's sitting there. Grice now does too. So all it requires is low just to drop the clutch in and uh, let it go all the way down to the flag. There's Sidney Muller in the Ford Sierra. A remarkable performance that. This car never has done a 24 hour race before. And he's still running at the finish. He's had innumerable problems, including replacing a turbocharger. They've had a great run during the European Touring Car Championship as well. We've got about maybe one lap to go. Time is running out. Tassar in the number 11 BMW. The Schnitzer entry goes across the line and Tassar, along with Dieter Cuesta, is going to pick up the Spiral 24-hour classic for 1986. Yes, onto the far side of the circuit now, running one to the BMWs. Even more than that, Rossi and the Meek and Jelly Brothers running in second spot, Roberto Revalia in third, Metch in fourth, Christian Danner in the 325 in fifth spot, and Denny Holm in sixth. Coming up to the last corner, La Source. The number 10 car out on the racetrack for the effect of coming down to the chequered flag. And Tassa, not too much to go now. He's going to take the 24-hour classic here at Spa Francochamps. The flags are out. The 24-hour classic is over. And it goes to BMW with Tassa and Dieter Cuesta, the winners. Yes, you can see Cuesta jumping up and down there by the side of the track. And Tassa goes through first to fifth positions there for the BMWs. And here come the Commodores. Alan Moffat on the inside. Separated here by uh, Siggy Muller, but they'll try and close up and let Neil Lowe now sprint. There's Lowe off to the right. They form it up, and here they come and getting a marvellous reception from this huge crowd at Spa Francorchamps. The King's Cup trophy is definitely going to go to the Aussies. They go across the line. was Mike Raymond's report on the Aussie battle from uh, Spa a couple of weeks ago.
certainly enjoyable racing as the Aussies took out the King's Cup. Well, I think we've picked the absolute perfect time to leave Surface Paradise International Raceway this afternoon, Neil Crompton, because the rain is starting to pour down. It certainly is. We just scraped through that one, didn't we, Pat? But uh, what an interesting race. A couple of big highlights today. The FM 104 Superbike Challenge, I think, was brilliant racing. And what a great performance from George Fury in the Nissan Skyline to take the win. Excellent performance from Jim Richards, that ever-reliable BMW 635. And I think uh, good to see Greg Hansford back in the Ford Mustang with uh, Queensland's uh, Dick Johnson doing so well. Uh, all in all, I think an interesting day. And maybe now we are seriously looking at having a very fast Nissan Skyline when we get to Bathurst. And perhaps George can go quicker than that blistering lap time that he did in Hardy's Heroes a few years ago to go under 2.13. As we look further down the list, a great performance by the Brock Moffat combination because they pitted three times. Yeah, fantastic to come back from so far. They spent, what? let me see, probably 30 or 40 seconds in the pits first time. If you recall, that tyre blistered. Then Alan and, uh, and Peter made their changeover, and then Peter had to come back in, incidentally, to replace another blistered tyre. So they'll be looking very carefully at those Pirelli radial tyres to find out what the problem was there. OK, well, it's all uh, org as well for Bathurst, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, it does indeed. I think we're in for one of our best James Hardys ever, something we'll all look forward to on October 4 and 5. Neil Crompton, thank you, and that is our next major motorsport telecast right here on the seven network on october 5 we'll take you live and exclusive to the mount panorama circuit at bathurst for the running of the 1986 james hardy 1000 and it should be fantastic stuff as neil crompton has mentioned many great australian challenges and of course there'll be a big overseas contingent as well at man at man panorama for the james hardy 1000 of 1986 as i said you'll see it live and exclusive here on seven and uh, i suppose we've got a little bit of time have you got a quick tip at this early stage well i'd say that judging on today's performance the nissan is looking very good uh, they drove away from the rest of the field and won comfortably let's face it, it was half a lap so they did it nicely but i can't help thinking those 635 bmws are going to be in good shape remember that we've got roberto revalia in the 635 teaming up with formula one ace gerhard berger in the bmw 635 and of course being backed by bob jane okay that just about wraps it up from here at surface paradise international raceway certainly hope you've enjoyed our coverage of the bp 300 this is pat welch on behalf of the entire seven sport team bidding you a very good afternoon.